para las palabras, ¿verdad? No, sí, nosotros desde aquí. Vale. Eh, salvo que alguien quiera levantarse y que se sienta es. libre, sí. Ángela es de él, Ángel es de él, so, all of us. Heavy. <laughs> It's like you were in the church, you know, the, the pop. <laughs> That me. Ah, it's difficult to move. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. <coughs> We are very pleased uh, to to have been able to hold this meeting in this hybrid format, in person and and remotely. And we are happy to see so many faces here around of our scientists who are involved in this cooperation between EMBL and CSIC. So you have seen the, the agenda for today. Yes, I will make uh, some uh, so, uh, formal um, announcements. You have in your budget the, the Wi-Fi uh, password. And uh, for, for the sake of organization, we will listen first to our president in her welcome words. And after that, we will go down to make a group photo, and then we will continue again with the, with the presentation. So, Rosa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Angeles. Uh, good morning. EMBL Director, Edith, EMBL Head of International Relations, Plamena, Head of EMBL Barcelona, James, eh, CSIC, eh, Vice President of International Affairs, Ángeles, Spanish Scientific Delegate at the EMBL, Vice Chair of EMBL, Ángela, Researchers of uh, both institutions, uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, event, to those of you who are here uh, present and also to those who are in remote mode. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you at the C headquarters to this workshop organized with the aim of promoting the cooperation between researchers of the two institutions. This is indeed an important occasion for all of us, firm believers of the importance of providing solutions to the challenges facing the science and research today. This meeting is a joint effort to reaffirm the commitment we made when we signed a memorandum of understanding a year and a half ago, based on a joint vision of the willingness of both institutions to generate synergies. We, EMBL and CSIC, have a long-standing collaboration which dates back to the seventh framework program and focus mainly on research infrastructures and exchange of scientists. But no doubt that still there are many more opportunities to explore. Topics of common interest for both institutions are covered in at least two of the six white papers for the next decade. Challenges in biomedicine and health and also in genome epigenetic and are also the core of some of the cooperation instruments 
that thesic has developed is the case of the thematic interdisciplinary platforms, in particular that of global health and also the thesic hubs, including life, cancer and nanomedicine. The topic selected for today's workshop, One Health Microbes in a Changing World, covers multidisciplinary aspects of a global One Health concept. The pandemic has touched us the relevance of international cooperation and I am sure that events like this one will contribute for further strengthening and stimulated scientific cooperation between both communities. I am grateful to the many experts who have come to share their knowledge and I am sure you will enjoy a fruitful and rewarding changes uh, during the meeting. I wish you the best during your stay in Madrid, during your stay here in CSIC headquarters, and I truly look forward to learning about the outcome. I would like to express my special thanks to Angela, Angela Nieto, that uh, push me at the beginning, you know, I think uh, Angela is the heart of this uh, cooperation. Thank you to all of you. And now we move uh, for the picture. I, uh, I don't believe now, so I don't know why they organize the picture now. So, it's my turn, I think, I have a clicker, yes, to, to say a huge thank you um, for, for hosting us here, dear Rosa. Uh, indeed, I remember a year and a half ago when we came here into the same building, it was completely empty because of the pandemic. We were masked up and we were very proud of ourselves to have managed to get together to sign the MOU and it was a real pleasure. And so now it's an even greater pleasure to actually be here to see some of the fruits of that discussion and the, and the signing. And I do want to thank everyone, particularly Angela, for having um, 
committed us into this, to the two Angelas actually, for having made this happen. Um, and for, for us here, the EMBL uh, is very, very proud to be linked in this way to CSIC. And I think the choice of topic today um, was very timely and very wise. And I'm very happy to see my colleagues from all over Emble uh, also here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure for us. So I'm not going to take up too much time. I wanted to just give you a few words about EMBL's new program, uh, which what we're going to be discussing today, microbes uh, on, this, on this planet and on humans, is very relevant, as you will see. But I wanted to just say a few words about uh, who we are. So the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, I don't think I have to remind everyone, is Europe's uh, life science research intergovernmental organization. We're the only ones um, in Europe to be doing this. We're independent of the European Union. Um, and yet, we're very important in bringing the European, our European member states, and right now we are almost 28 member states. Estonia will be just joining us this year. So our member states um, support us, fund us, and they are the reason we exist. That's why we are here. This is why EMBL was created. It was to serve European science. So we do this through our five missions, which are actually shown here. So the first is to perform, I'm not sure I should use a pointer actually, because this is mainly online. So. so the first is to perform excellent research. And I think you're going to be hearing a lot of fantastic research and science today. I'm very happy. Um, the second thing is that we provide services and access to infrastructures. And this is something that uh, EMBL was also really created for it fundamentally there is um, a way to do science more efficiently, to collaborate more synergistically if we can share our resources and our infrastructures. And that's why one of the main reasons why EMBL was created. So some of the services that we provide are almost invisible, and yet they're amongst the most important services that the life science um, area has. So we, um, we have different sites that produce different services, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but in particular in areas such as bioinformatics and computational and data approaches. Um, EMBL is at the, at the heart of much of what um, Europe and the world uses. We, our third mission is training, and the training mission is also incredibly important. Um, EMBL has always been a model for how to do training, international PhD programs. We train stu master students, PhDs, postdoctoral um, trainees. We host young people. Uh, our group leaders are usually very young. And we have a nine-year rule, which means that they move on after nine years or maximum nine years, which means that we're constantly bringing in new people and um, people are moving on back to their host countries or to other countries. We also organize courses and conferences, and this is, I'm sure many of you have been to um, EMBL Heidelberg, where one of the biggest life sciences conference centers exists. And all through the pandemic, we've been able to rise up to the challenge of not being able to do this physically, and we've done a lot online. And we're very open to new ideas about the kind of um, courses and conferences we can do, as you'll be hearing with the new program. Our fourth mission is to do innovation and translation. This is something that's becoming increasingly important, particularly in the life sciences. We also develop new technologies, and often some of the technologies that are then put on the market originated from discoveries and inventions at EMBL. That includes cryo-EM, for example. And last but not least, and that's one of the main reasons we're here today, we're here to integrate life sciences across Europe. We actually bring, we're sort of the glue that brings scientists together to collaborate, but we also are at the heart of many of the initiatives that you know of, including things like Eurobioimaging, Elixir, uh, and many, many others. So um, I'm very happy because actually our missions fit very well with all that CSIC um, is about and, and needs. Um, and in the future, we hope that we'll be able to serve the, the Spanish community across all of these missions more than ever before. And here on the map, you can see where our different sites are. We work from six institutes in five different countries. Our most recent, which you'll be hearing about very soon, um, was created uh, in Barcelona. And it actually arose from a partnership, and that's the other thing that EMBL does. We have partnerships with many countries, many institutes, that try to model themselves on the way we work, our philosophy of doing science, the way we hire people, the way we organize our facilities. And in fact, this was how um, EMBL Barcelona 
Barcelona arose from a partnership that, that then led to Spain becoming a host site. So these are the sites very briefly. Um, I mentioned that we have six institutes uh, across Europe. Uh, the headquarters is in Heidelberg, where we cover the biggest breadth of life sciences research, and many of my colleagues uh, from Heidelberg are here. Our second largest site, which is al also incredibly important, is the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is, I think, the biggest bioinformatics institute in the world, and hosts much of the data and many of the tools that life scientists work use, and, uh, and I'm very happy that Rob Finn is here, um, who is at the EBI and, and runs some of the biggest uh, uh, tools and, and resources that are available there, and you'll be hearing from him later. And we have several sites where structural biology can happen. Um, we won't be talking too much, I think, today about structural biology, but it's, it's at the foundation of what EMBL does as well. So both in Grenoble and in Hamburg, we provide access to synchrotrons. And, and in fact, thanks to the data that came out of our synchrotrons, as well as many other sites, a huge um, uh, collection of structures of proteins was developed, which led to the latest tool that many structural biologists are using, and which I'll mention in a minute, which is AlphaFold, uh, and which is actually hosted and run by the EBI uh, in a collaboration with Google DeepMind. So, last but not least, the two sites I, um, I mentioned already, Barcelona, and, and James will be telling you more about that. And we also have a site in Rome, which is dedicated to epigenetics and neurobiology. And I've been hearing about the new institute that the CSIC will be, has opened, or will be opening, uh, focusing on neurosciences. So there as well, I think there'll be many, many uh, opportunities for collaboration in the future. So, I will not say any more about EMBL Barcelona. It's our most recent site. It's been hugely successful. James will tell you more. Um, it was just reviewed, in fact, just over a month ago and got stellar reviews by an international panel um, just a few years after starting. It's already become, uh, I would say, uh, a, a sort of unique niche for um, engineering of tissues, bioengineering, computational experimental approaches. And, and James, will be tell James is, as the head of the site, will be telling you more about this. And hopefully you will see how many more collaborations, I think, will come in the future thanks to the group leaders and the activities at the site uh, within Spain. So um, some recent highlights. I already mentioned um, AlphaFold. This is a true revolution. I, many of us scientists talk about scientific revolutions. Well, I think in my life, I will say that this was one of them. Um, and it really was part of this uh, special role that EMBL has to be this international organization who has a, at its heart um, the philosophy of doing open science. Um, and it's for this reason that we decided to take on um, this, this tool, this approach using AI to understand and predict protein structures. So the whole human proteome, but also many other organisms are now becoming available to science, scientists thanks to this, um, this approach. We also um, have conducted some surveys which uh, try to uh, understand the value of EMBL to the community. And so we did two of these just last year, one of our experimental services by Technopolis, the other one of our computational services at the EBI by uh, Bigri. These are available. You're welcome to look at them. But the, the message was that we're absolutely essential for science to happen um, in Europe. And I think um, Spain is a great user not just because uh, it's a host site, but also because there's a lot of science going on in Spain where EMBL uh, services can be useful. Last but not least, and I won't, get, well, I won't say more about this, but I'm very happy to discuss, in our new program, we've become very interested in understanding what's happening to our planet uh, from the perspective of biodiversity, um, planetary health, and in fact, we were observers at COP26, and uh, Rob Finn was one of the people who actually attended COP. This was the first time ever that EMBL was part of a COP, and I think it's very important because it's clear that there's a lack of molecular, um, I wouldn't even say understanding, molecular awareness that actually the life sciences could bring some of the solutions that we need um, in, in, in this time of uh, crisis. And so we even wrote a white paper about harnessing molecular biology to accelerate the green recovery. And it was co-signed by um, some scientists from CSIC as well. So um, one slide that is, just captures a tiny bit of the many, many collaborations that we have um, with Spain. 
uh, Spanish scientists uh, work with us. Uh, um, in some cases, for example, the, the ocean microbiota uh, paper that's shown here, um, this was actually signed by uh, Ramon Masana as, as the senior um, leader. And, and we have worked closely with Spanish scientists on the ocean microbiomes and on oceans in general, which I know is something that's very important right now here in Spain. So this is just one example relevant to today's topic. We also have um, scientists collaborating on the topic of the gut microbiome. I, this is just one tiny example. I'm sure Pierre will, and others will give many more. And also uh, using uh, cancer models. So this is a paper with, uh, from Wolfgang Huber, uh, who is based at Embel um, uh, Heidelberg as well, to use machine learning approaches to understand, to try and get an understanding of the kinds of um, pathways that are involved in uh, certain types of cancer, such as uh, chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. So these are just some glimpses of the collaborations that we have with, with Spain. And I just wanted to then mention the new program. Um, this has been a big endeavor for the last three years. EMBL has been building up our next era. Uh, we have to try and be at the forefront. We have to be one step ahead. That's why we were invented, uh, in order to help Europe uh, keep ahead of the game. So this is um, why this new program is called From Molecules to Ecosystems, because we believe that in order to understand life, you need to understand it at the molecular level. Molecules are the building blocks of life. But in order to really understand life, you have to understand it in the context of where it really happens, which of course is in the context of ecosystems. So this program is really designed to try and build up a molecular mechanistic understanding of life in every context exposed to different environments, life in communities and populations. And many of the talks you're gonna to hear today are relevant to this program. And if you'd like to see more about it, it's completely available online. You just have to go there and download all 100, 256 pages of it. Um, but it's built on three pillars. I just want to say they're very important to us. One is it, it has to be a, a, an ambitious vision. As I said, we have to be one step ahead. We can't do everything but we can aim very high. We have to aim high if we want to get somewhere. And we want to try and be relevant as well to societal challenges. We still do basic research at EMBL, but we can deliver in many, many applied ways. And these can be relevant to topics such as the loss of biodiversity or the impact of climate change or pollution, uh, food security, as well as, of course, uh, everything linked to human health. But perhaps the most important part of this program is that it is based on collaboration. We have to be able to collaborate with other scientists in Europe in order for this to work. Because in order to understand the molecular basis of ecosystems, we have to work with specialists in areas that EMBL itself doesn't cover, including, for example, epidemiologists, ecologists, zoologists, mathematicians. So EMBL has always been interdisciplinary and you know, collaborative, but this program is designed to do even more. And so in this workshop, I hope this will be an invitation for you to engage with us and collaborate with us and use us, come see us, train with us um, more than ever before, because we need you for this program to work. And I would say Europe and the world needs you in order for this uh, program to work. So um, the whole program is summarized in this one diagram which is that we are basing ourselves on everything EMBL does across our six sites, all of our scientists working in these different areas, for example, um, bioinformatics, microbiology, cell biology, developmental biology. These areas already existed within EMBL, but we would like to move into these new areas in collaboration with many scientists around Europe, and they're shown on the outside. And amongst these is microbial ecosystems, which is, I think, probably the um, topic for which we already had great strengths, but we realized we can um, go even further, and that's the topic of today's workshop. There's also planetary biology, which is highly relevant to what you'll be hearing today. Um, and in fact, some of the co-chairs of these transversal themes, as we call them, are actually here from EMBL. Pierre Bork, Rob Finn, Nassos Tipas. So one of the other areas is infection biology um, and microbial ecosystems and infection biology are quite linked, but yet distinct. Uh, but in fact, Nassos is a co-chair of both of them. So just to say that we're going to evolve into these areas thanks to our turnover. 
you know, every um, five-year period, almost half of EMBL's group and team leaders move on and new ones come in. So it's very easy for us to evolve. We don't have to shut something down dramatically. We can actually progressively move into these areas. And it's happening right now as we speak. We're already seeing the new people coming to EMBL who are relevant to these new areas. So um, I'm not going to go through this in detail because you will be hearing about much of this today. So in the area of microbial ecosystems and infection biology, we actually want to build up the research that we do, but also some of the um, approaches that already are available, but we'd like to make more available to the community. So, um, for example, getting a grasp on the community composition of, of microbes and, and what they can actually do functionally, be it related to human health or to nutrition, etc. We also want to try and understand how new models of microbes might work, De, you know, define which ones are relevant and then create proper models out of them. This takes time, effort, and again, collaboration. And last but not least, of course, we have to understand pathogens. I think when the pandemic hit us, Envil had already started to think about what, would it, what is it about emerging epidemics or pandemics. And, and we realized that this is somewhere where Envil should be able to help uh, bring people together to think about the resources we need to, to prevent this from happening again. And actually, um, for example, the data portals that the European Commission used were actually generated at EMBL EBI uh, for COVID-19. But we want to have new strategies, not just to um, prevent pandemics, but understand, for example, some of the next big killers, such as antimicrobial resistance, which is spreading and um, not easy to control, given that many companies have just stopped making antibiotics or trying to find new antibiotics. So all of these areas, I think, uh, will be hopefully touched on today and are relevant in the next five years or more at EMBL. And the other area that is new, but which we would like to elaborate on and engage on is human ecosystems. And when I say human ecosystems, I mean humans in their physical environment, exposed to toxins, etc. Their biological environment, which of course includes microbes, and their social environment, which of course includes uh, behavior, which, as I said, maybe with the new institute, we could uh, link up very nicely there. So um, on all these topics, we would love to be able to uh, connect with you and to tell you more about what we're planning as well. And so I'm almost done. I just want to highlight the new services that we're bringing to you in the future so that you can help engage with us, not just to use them, but also even to design some of them. So microbial ecosystem services, this is not something that EMBL was necessarily known for, but that we're going to build up in the coming years. And both Nassau Sipas, Pierre Bork, uh, Mickey Zimmerman, Rob Finn, all of the people here are going to be involved in thinking about what we need, both in terms of the data resources, but also the types of um, you know, facilities to do automation, to understand microbial communities, to do biobanking. So these are, these are areas that we're just la uh, launching. So please feel free to, to engage with us. The imaging center that just opened in, uh, at Emble Heidelberg, where we have a number of pilot projects, this gives access to, um, to microscopes that are pre-commercial in some cases. So again, you're very welcome to apply and come and work with us um, in this state-of-the-art uh, imaging center. And last but not least, uh, we have a genomic medicine platform, which is already well uh, connected in Spain, I have to admit, um, collaborations with the National Health Institute, Carlos III, and many, many uh, interactions also in, um, in Barcelona. Um, and so this is an area that we will be um, enhancing in the coming years uh, and is, is firmly written into the new program. Um, I mentioned planetary biology and just to say that EMBL works across the six sites, but we're also coming to our member states. And this is a flagship project that we have set up, which is to br bring mobile services to different marine stations, accompanied by a boat, a very little boat, but very effective boat, called TARA. Uh, so TARA, together with uh, mobile laboratories, will be visiting different sites. And Spain is actually one of the most visited site um, countries of all, with three stops in 2023 and another three stops in 2024. And uh, Pierre, I'm sure, would be very happy to tell you more about those. Um, the idea, though, is that we come and, and, and we work with the scientists at the marine um, institutes and, um, and try to uh, give our expertise, but also sample deeply and systematically so that we can gather data that will be useful to, to have a better understanding of what's happening at these land-water interfaces, which is where most of the interesting 
biodiversity changes are happening, in fact, and also, of course, where pollution uh, and other um, uh, crises seem to, to hit. So um, we also have many, many different areas of training and outreach, which will be elaborated on. I already mentioned that we would like to invite you to give us ideas. I just wanted to highlight that we have several programs that are either launched or will be launched. One is the ARISE program, which are fellowships for technology developers and engineers. These are three-year fellowships open to all. And the others are some interdisciplinary postdoc um, fellowships where we're launching a pilot this year, and they're targeted to linking up to member state institutes. So Spain, uh, please keep an eye on this. CSIC uh, will definitely be, uh, uh, I think, interested in collaborating with us for this postdoctoral program. And I should say that Spain is one of the top users of EMBLS training. And in this new program, I think particularly in the areas such as microbial um, ecosystems, there will be many opportunities to develop uh, new types of training, new courses, new conferences. Okay, so actually I skipped my last slide, but I can leave it there. These are just some of the opportunities you might have to engage with us um, with a new program. Um, I think I've covered most of these areas, but just want to say that we're very collaborative and we care about mattering to institutes, to many institutes. CSIC, I know, covers many, many relevant institutes. And so we really would like to um, reinforce the collaborations we have and the usefulness we have in Spain, but also to see that with this new program, we can take, a, I would say, a step leap into the future. And I think Spain is very strong in this area of understanding ecosystems from human to planetary. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing many, many um, discoveries and uh, collaborations in, in the coming years, thanks to this uh, memorandum of understanding. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Edith, for, for very, this very nice overview of the EMBL uh, program and uh, the path uh, towards the next future in the next uh, years. Now we come to uh, a place closer to us, and we will listen to James Sherp in, uh, in an introduction to the EMBL Barcelona. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I would like to start also by um, thanking Thesik and also Embel and all the Embel colleagues here for, um, for making this event um, happen, which is going to be very exciting. I'm not a microbes person, so I'm going to learn a lot. Um, and it's actually wonderful just to be back in, in Madrid. And I was remembering just now that my first interaction with Thesik was, in fact, 20 years ago. I came and did a project in the CNB the um, National Center for Biotechnology in the Autonoma. And it was actually one of the great experiences of my life. I've still got many, many friends in Madrid and I love coming back here. So um, I want to mention as, as briefly as I can, but give you a flavor about what uh, Embel Barcelona is about. So as Edith has, has explained, um, there, there were five sites and there are now six sites across um, five countries, the last one being us in, in Barcelona here. And I also want to say that um, in the context of this interaction with um, Thesic and the MOU, I should just say Spain has been an extremely welcoming country for us to get up and running in many, many ways. And I think Thesic just uh, is one example of that. We've had really just positive help, support, and interactions um, from all sides. It's been a, a great experience. I mean, the unit was set up just four years ago, as I'll, as I'll mention. So we're just sort of getting to the end of our establishment phase. And um, I should also thank Angela Nieto, um, because really, as has been mentioned, but she was really one of the key people that actually made this happen. So many people to thank, um, in particular Angela. And um, I'm sure we're going to have many more interactions. So I am going to sort of briefly -ish give you a flavor about uh, Embel Barcelona, which is not primarily about microbes. You would probably say that you know, microbes live in everything. So even if you don't realize you're studying microbes, you probably are studying microbes. But um, in principle, we're studying tissue biology and disease modeling. And our view is that, um, in a way, what science has done very successfully over a long time is break things down to their smaller and smaller components. And of course, 
it has been recognized for a while now. We also have to understand how complexity emerges, how you build things back up together, which is sort of a, a question of construction or even a question of engineering, but engineering at a sort of biological um, scale. So our focus really is in this particular part of the, the scale, going from microscopy up to, to humans. These are all images from our unit. And as, this, as biology is a system that builds, maybe we can learn about biology by building, by sort of tinkering using biology a bit like Lego. And also um, taking ideas that have been learned from decades of developmental biology, which is an area where multicellularity and tissues have been studied a lot, and extend this to understand um, things about the human body, about physiology, and um, more sort of adult processes. So we have, I'm just gonna now explain roughly the, what exists in Embel Barcelona. These are the um, six faculty, and it started with Jim Swoger and myself being recruited about four years ago. Jim runs an imaging facility. My lab works on organogenesis, in particular how the limb develops. And we joined um, officially in 2017, but really the labs were started in 2018. Then our next two group leaders were Miki Ebisuya and Vikas Trivedi. They work on embryonic-like tissues, but not actually embryos. And it's this kind of step from in vivo towards sort of engineering, tinkering, playing with tissues. And the two last recruits that have actually joined, which was um, back in 2019, are Christina Haas and Maria Bernabeu, who work on an amazing kind of system, which is growing vasculature in vitro, but in such a way that you can flow blood or liquids or fluids through the vasculature to recreate all kinds of amazing um, processes. What we're very happy about is that our sort of diversity of our team, um, not just in terms of the people, but in terms of their backgrounds. You can see three of them are engineers by training and three biologists. And as I said, I'm gonna just try to give you a sort of a flavor of what we're interested in. Our primary goals can be divided into sort of understanding tissues per se, the complexity that arises from multicellularity, disease modeling, which can be relevant maybe to today's conference, and tissue engineering, and then these three goals very much interact with each other. And as a flavor of what is interesting about multicellular um, systems, here we have a system that, that we work on, on in my lab where a bunch of cells, embryonic cells, they spontaneously organize themselves as, as all good embryos should do, um, switching genes on and off in, in the right um, positions to create something meaningful, to create a tissue or an organ. And this has a quite mathematical um, basis for trying to understand these kind of things. And this is another element that runs through the lab. So, Miki Ebisuya works also on embryonic tissue, which spontaneously creates oscillations, and we try to understand that from a mathematical point of view as well. Um, Vikas Trivedi is working on another kind of embryonic tissue where the movements, the sort of orchestrated movements of thousands of cells is one of the key things we're trying to understand. And another example here is the endothelial cells that I mentioned, which can spontaneously organize in a dish into something like a vascular network. This is being worked on by Christina Haas. And these examples that I've shown you so far are about this part of building tissues, building tissues, maybe adult tissues or embryonic tissues. But the blood vessel examples are also um, have a strong relevance to something on a more physiological scale, which is the flow of blood. And here you can see in a time-lapse movie of one of these in vitro systems where fluid and cells um, is flowing through the blood. It's again an example of emergent behavior, emergent behavior of many different cell types interacting. And this is the, the example from Maria Bernabeu's lab who works actually on um, malaria. As a, she works on infectious um, diseases and in especially malaria and is sort of recreating the, the pathology of human cerebral malaria in vitro. <clears throat> so quantification is uh, a very important thing for us as well. We develop a lot of tools for quantification. And in a way, <clears throat> given that this conference today is on a slightly different scale, what I think is the most useful here is simply to see what kinds of tools, what kinds of um, approaches we are developing 
and to see whether any of this could be useful for, for your research. So why do we do all of this? Well, one, one type of technology I should quickly mention is mesoscopic imaging. So mesoscopic imaging for us is imaging things that are not really microscopic and not like human patients, but the scale that is in between. And this example actually is a human adult, uh, not a human, a, a mouse adult brain that is being used in studies of uh, cryptococcal infection. So it's a, it is a micro, microbe in that sense. Um, and this is a kind of technology that may well be interesting to some of you. And um, in Barcelona, we really have one of the kind of um, strongest hotspots of expertise in this kind of imaging. So not really microscopic or not whole patient, but this size range in between. Now, a quick flavor of the disease modeling. I mentioned Maria Bernabeu's work. Essentially, she's recreating a particular complication of malaria in a dish with all human cells. So human endothelial cells, um, human red blood cells, and the human um, malarial parasite. And she can actually run this through these vessels and try to, in vitro, and try to use this as a way to get a handle on really what's causing the, um, the sort of uh, blockages that occur and the inflammation that occurs in cerebral malaria. And in a similar vein, our other group, um, Christina Haas, also works in vitro with vasculature, but in that case to study other diseases, cancer in this particular case. So observing how tumors in vitro grow and respond differently to drugs when they're in a vascular context than if you're just growing the tumor on its own. Another element that I mentioned was engineering. And again, just to emphasize, we'd have two kinds of engineering in mind, really. One is engineering tools, and the other is engineering tissues. So again, if any of this could be valuable to, for collaborations, then um, please just get in touch. So we engineer a lot of tools in-house. We have a workshop, and we are trying to engineer tissues, both to understand how they work and for potentially um, beneficial reasons like medical reasons, like um, regeneration or transplantation. So, and then one of the final sort of themes is mathematical modeling. And um, this is just a kind of a, an overview of uh, the fact that we do various kinds of mathematical modeling. In particular, we're getting more and more into agent-based modeling where you model um, individual cells, hundreds, thousands of them, which in our context is largely about tissues. But um, I'm going to give you a, a glimpse of a project that is very much to do with microbes in a moment where modeling will also be a very important part. So just to emphasize, because I think it's not always understood in EMBL that uh, about EMBL from the outside, that EMBL is just one organization, as Edith has explained, but um, EMBL Barcelona is simply a part of EMBL. We are not a separate center. We are a part of EMBL, and this is just to show the large number and growing number of, of just natural interactions that we have in terms of collaborations, shared postdocs, shared students, um, publications, etc., with other parts of EMBL. And then very importantly, our interactions across Spain. Um, this is, a, again, a snapshot. I'm happy to discuss more details, but we have different kinds of activities. I mean, I'm in, involved in one of the um, Redes de Excelencia, which is, in fact, a THESIC um, initiative. Um, we have collaborations and other kinds of interactions with you know, many institutes, and you will see that many of those are, in fact, THESIC institutes. Um, our next EMBL in Spain event will be in Seville at the Cabade, which is the Andalusian Center for Developmental Biology, which is also a Thysic Institute. So Edith mentioned the, the grant um, program from Molecules to Ecosystems. We try to support and be involved in some of those. In fact, planetary biology, infection biology, and theory. And I'm just now going to finish by giving you a flavor project that we have not started, but it's in collaboration with two scientists in Spain, um, the first of which is Ricard Soleil. And he is in Barcelona in this Institute for Evolutionary Biology, the IBE, which is also a joint institute between, a joint center between the UPF University and THESIC. And he has been working for quite a long time on the theory of whether um, soil ecosystems 
could be made more resilient by certain kinds of um, manipulations, shall we say. One could be even some genetic um, modification of cyanobacteria. Um, there's a growing literature on this. And um, I think Victor de Lorenzo, who I'm not sure if he's here, is also very involved in this area of research. Um, we are starting a project where to, to help um, develop this a little bit, which is to do experiments like that, you will need a closed environment for um, cultivating this soil, these biocrusts, to study their dynamics, how they maybe respond to global warming, increased temperatures and other kind of environmental changes, and possibly mitigation strategies. It's actually a collaboration between Ricard Solé at the UPF and Fernando Maestra in Alicante. And in a nutshell, the part that, that I'm just going to mention now is that Fernando down in Alicante has been studying um, dry land soil biocrusts for a long time. And in a semi-controlled way, you can see pictures here of their, their site, their sort of laboratory site where they take these soil crusts and um, do all kinds of uh, measurements and experiments. The idea here is to take this into a more controlled environment that would be called a microcosm or a mesocosm. And Ricard's group already started a little bit on this over the last couple of years, but now Emble is going to join with them and help. And together we're going to push this project um, forwards faster, hopefully. And the steps of this particular project are designing these microcosms, testing them, seeing if we can maintain soil crusts healthy for a matter of months or hopefully even longer, observing the impact of simulated global warming on them. In this aspect, we will take advantage of Embel's other strengths, strengths in things like um, metabolomics and metagenomics to assess and monitor biodiversity of the microbial ecosystem. Um, with Pierre Borg's lab. There are other ways to analyze the health of the system as well, to do with um, monitoring the, the gases that emerge from, from the soil, and mathematical modeling. So this comes to a little bit to our expertise in modeling thousands of cells that are within a tissue. Now we're going to, with Ricard's help, um, try to, to be involved in modeling thousands of cells in a, in a little ecosystem. So that's a flavor of this project that we'll, we'll get up and running now. And um, I would just like to leave you with the summary of the themes that are important to Embel Barcelona, which is primarily at the tissue level, and say that we are a part of Embel in Spain. I mean, it's been a long time um, coming, and there is now Embel physically in Spain. And so please use us as a connecting point uh, to the rest of EMBL if it's uh, convenient, if it's helpful. And um, I would just like to advertise again that we have our next EMBL in Spain event in Seville on the 4th of November, which is indeed in an institute which is also a Thysic Institute. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, James. I'm now in charge of telling you in uh, 10 minutes. This was a planned, uh, uh, some few words about uh, CSIC. So the most important aspect of CSIC is uh, for sure the human capital, our people, our persons. We are roughly 13,000 uh, people quite balanced between men and women, and out of them, uh, roughly 5,000 are scientists. Uh, from then, uh, 1,500 roughly are uh, research in training. And then we have the technicians, and then we have managers. Um, all these people contribute to make possible uh, the research we perform, we carry out in CSIC. We have a quite complex uh, structure. For many of you faces I'm, I know, uh, this is well known, but uh, probably uh, some of the people who don't belong to our institution don't know that we are so complex. We are 126 institutes, 
Some of them are own institutes, only owned by CSIC. Some of them are mixed institutes, joint uh, uh, adventures with uh, normally universities, but sometimes uh, so regional government also. And as you see there in the map, they are distributed uh, throughout uh, Spain. We have also institutional delegations in those cases in which uh, when, uh, where we have more than two institutes. And with the new additions of the national centers, for example, the, the Oceanographic Institute, EIO, uh, we have nine regional uh, places also uh, from this new institute. So this is, uh, therefore, we, we have a complex also structure here in the central organization with three vice presidencies, one uh, cabinet uh, chief and uh, a general secretary, and afterwards, uh, complex and uh, new uh, structures of collaborations, uh, uh, collaboration as are the CSIC hubs and the uh, technological, uh, the thematic uh, uh, platforms. So the budget, because this is interesting for many of you, we, uh, this year we we reached the 1,000 million of euros, and uh, out of that uh, we get roughly 40% as competitive uh, funds, and the rest uh, is coming from the from the government, either by the regular transfer or by the recovery uh, funds that we will have in the couple of uh, next couple of years. Of course, uh, if you compare this with the previous budget, it has increased a lot, but in this year budget, we also have uh, the, the budget of the national centers included here. So it's not so great, the, the increase. In any case, uh, together with the, the transfer of the government that um, essentially or mostly we uh, spend in, in personnel, in the salaries, we also contract and hire a lot of, of people from the competitive fundings we get. From the scientific point of view, we are structured in three uh, areas, society, life, and matter. Although we are, uh, again, uh, changing this model and probably moving to a, a scheme of four, four areas. We have some uh, few institutes which have the seal of excellence in Spain. 11 of them are Severo Ochoa uh, excellence centers and five of them are Maria de Maectu. And some of them are also involved in the EMBL collaboration. Uh, and, and I'm a bit surprised because this is a different presentation than the one I, I sent. It's, it's a bit uh, longer, but I will, I will pass, uh, pass uh, more, more quickly. So we are involved also in infrastructures. We have some specific uh, uh, facilities that uh, we run from our, from our, organization, and among them are very special research uh, boats, research ships, and also are the uh, infrastructure related with astronomical observatory. We have also a couple of museums here, the Natural History Museum and the Royal Botanic Garden. In our, our program, our uh, plans for the future, we uh, decided to, to um, focus on 14 strategic topics, which are the scientific challenges in which we will focus in the next, next decade. And from then, uh, the fourth one, challenges in biomedicine and health and genome and epigenetics are very relevant for the cooperation we have with him. 
Also, our cooperation is very important. We have international collaboration with many countries. Out of, uh, of them, we have many, many uh, cooperation with institutions in Europe, which is the most abundant. But uh, as you see in the map, wherever in the world there is a place in which, which CSIC cooperate. And uh, outstanding is France, Germany, in Europe, also the USA, Colombia, Argentina, in uh, Ibero-American. So, uh, our uh, succeed in, uh, in uh, the horizon, uh, Euro horizon, uh, horizon Europe program is, well, you can consider succeed, you, you can consider we should increase, but uh, we uh, have to say that uh, uh, from the next uh, framework programs, uh, we have increased a lot, and indeed from the last one uh, to the previous one, to the sevens, we increased 45% uh, the, the, the budget, uh, the funds we, re, we got from, uh, from Europe funding, and we increased the number of proposals by 22%. And only in this uh, beginning of this horizon Europe, there are already uh, 739 applications. And we have uh, from last year 435 ongoing collaboration projects and uh, a lot of uh, uh, Marie Curie fellowships and ERC. So we come now to the infrastructures, and this is a topic in which we collaborate a lot with EMBL. And here you see in the health and nutrition topic, some of the uh, ESFRIs uh, in which we are involved, Elixir, Struct, you open screen, Ibisba, Eurobio Imaging, and I would like to say hello to Inmaculada, who is here, the representative of our Ministry for International Affairs, who has been involved for many years in the ESFRIS in particular, so she knows very well and she has support our participation in these infrastructures. And we have also an office in Brussels, who is in, which is in charge of scientific diplomacy, communication, and promoting the collaboration and participation of uh, our institution in Brussels. The, the institutions which uh, with, we more collaborate are CNRS, Fraunhofer Institute, and the CNR in Italy but we keep a good cooperation also with Max Planck uh, Institute and other research organizations. So I will not go into the facts and figures of the last framework program. And uh, up to here, this is what uh, I wanted to tell you about CSIC uh, as a whole and uh, the possibilities of cooperation with uh, EMBL. Thank you very much. To the last part of this opening session, and we will listen to Angela Nieto telling us about the role of national scientific representatives in EMBL. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, um, uh, dear Director General Edith uh, and uh, representatives of uh, EMBO the SIC and also the, uh, the Ministry of Science and Innovation, INMA. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for, for being here. It's actually a real pleasure to, to see you know, so many people gathering uh, for science today. Um, so uh, I really uh, wanted to thank, uh, to thank uh, the SIC and uh, EMBL for, uh, you know, and particularly Rosa and Edith, uh, uh, President and Director General, for embracing this collaboration and this project with such, uh, you know, energy and, and passion, actually. So this is why we are here today at the, at the first uh, workshop uh, joint um, uh, uh, between the two institutions. Um, just to put it into context, uh, let me tell you that, uh, of course, as you might know, EMBL was founded in, in 1974. 
and the Spain entered EMBL in 1986. So this is over 35 years of, of collaboration between uh, the, the, you know, Spain and, uh, and EMBL. Um, I'm here today as the Spanish scientific delegate from the ministry to, to EMBL Council. And uh, then you might wonder what is really EMBL Council. Of course, you know what EMBL is and that you've been listening to all the uh, fantastic activities and the fantastic new program. Uh, but what is the Council? The Council is actually the governing body of EMBL. Uh, it is composed of all member states, uh, which are at the moment 27, 27 member states, and each uh, one member is represented at Council by up to two delegates. And uh, usually, uh, the two delegates are one uh, from uh, the, min the corresponding ministry, so administrative, and one scientist. And I am the scientist of, uh, you know, representing uh, the Spanish delegation at, uh, at councils. And what is it that we do? And what is it that actually not we, but the EMBO Council does? Um, EMBO, EMBO Council uh, appoints a director general. Uh, it actually makes sure that all the agreements with all the member states are, com are complied. Uh, it um, selects and approves uh, uh, the uh, Scientific Advisory Committee, and this is composed of renowned scientists uh, which give, provide independent advice to Council on proposals from the Director General. And what is the most important proposal of Director General? This is the, uh, the program, the scientific program. Uh, that needs to be approved every five years, and is called an indicative scheme. And this indicative scheme has um, indeed two, two important parts, because it is uh, both science and also finances. And both the scientific program and the financial program need to be uh, approved by council and actually by unanimous vote. Uh, this, uh, well, I'm sure you realize this is not trivial, uh, you know, 27 member states, but, uh, you know, it takes um, a long time, <laughs> Director General could tell you, and, uh, you know, many people here actually in the room, um, it's not easy, but it works, and uh, it actually worked uh, very nicely for the, you know, last time we had to do that, and the new program that, um, that Edith uh, presented to you briefly, because it is amazing, it is so wide and fantastic that, of course, there wasn't enough time to, to show how, how wonderful it is. But uh, that started, actually, this new one started just uh, January the 1st this year. So we have uh, five years ahead of uh, wonderful uh, science and collaborations. Um, so uh, once, you know, uh, mentioned what uh, EMBL Council is, I also wanted to take just two minutes to tell you what EMBC Council is, because I'm not sorry, but I think it is uh, important for, particularly for Spanish scientists here, because it's, it is not always actually easy to, to, to see, you know, how the whole, um, you know, ensemble of organizations in the European molecular um, uh, biology works. So, um, EMBC Council, and I'm saying that because I'm also the Spanish representative at that council, is an intergovernmental organization funded in 1969. So this is um, five years after EMBO was funded, the European Molecular Biology Organization. And uh, this um, EMBC organization, which is the conference, European Molecular Biology Conference, is the um, um, I mean, was was actually created with the idea of um, you know EMBL, uh, to the funding a lab which is EMBL, and to provide support to to, to scientists. So the, the council is actually um, the M e the conference council is actually the uh, the body to fund um, uh, EMBO. And therefore, you know, in this particular case, it's a bit different because there are not uh, 27 countries. There are 30 countries, three more countries in EMBC than in uh, EMBL. And um, it has, you know, sort of uh, three communities, uh, the EMBO members, the EMBO young investigators, and the EMBO fellows that are actually composed EMBO that, as I said, is funded by the conference. So indeed, now you can see how the different member states are actually funding EMBO and funding EMBO. And this is why we need to have the two councils, okay? And I'm representative, um, I mean, from Spain for both, for both councils. Um, so uh, I have to say that I'm really very much embarrassed about, you know, I mean, saying that many people saying that I, you know, was involved in all these programs. And the thing is that this is what I have to do. You know, this is my job. We are here to, here to help. 
So all the uh, uh, national representatives are sitting at councils because we really need to help in the cooperation between the organization EMBL and, of course, the, uh, the different countries and the different ministries. So uh, in addition to that, we also try to be in touch with the scientific community, which is not that easy, but um, through, particularly through the EMBO members and uh, the EMBO young investigators and the, the EMBO fellows, uh, we try to actually um, communicate the most important things that are happening in, in EMBO and, uh, and in EMBO as well, of course, but particularly in EMBO. So um, uh, in... Um, in 2005, you have heard already, uh, EMBOL uh, started a cooperation with Spain already, which is the partnership, and the partnership was established with one of the units, systems biology, that was within the CRG, the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona. And that was really very interesting because that allowed to start a real, um, you know, very close collaboration between, between EMBOL and, and the Spain, and also because it was... Um, um, the opportunity for Spain to have uh, research institutes that were actually um, run uh, using a governance which was very similar to that of EMBL. And that uh, was unprecedented in Spain and helped a lot to actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, try and uh, put forward the new ideas in, um, in, scientific, uh, in scientific research. So that happened in 2005 when uh, the CRG was led by uh, Miguel Beato. And, um, and it was a success from the very beginning, and it still is, because the, 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 uh, the partnership still, still works and is still, is still there. Uh, but, of course, that success opened the possibility of Spain proposing the most important proposal that Spain has had in history, which is that maybe uh, this could be uh, the base for the creation of, the, of, the, uh, of, of, an, of uh, an EMBOL site in Spain. And you heard about that, that's EMBOL Barcelona. So I was very fortunate to be recruited to the, uh, to the ministry team to actually work to, to, towards, uh, you know, the um, uh, generation and the creation of this institution that, as you heard, um, was opened uh, at the end of uh, 2017. And, um, you know, it was, uh, everything has been really fantastic. And I have to say now that they cannot hear me that, uh, you know, this um, site is actually fantastic. And uh, I tell you, if you have not visited yet, you, should, you really should. Because it's, it's a place where, you know, every scientist I know would like to actually be there and at least work there for, for, a, for a short time. Because it is really fantastic, the, um, not only the infrastructures and the science, but also the atmosphere. And I have to also, you know, I mean, thank everybody here, but particularly I want to, to have a few words for, for James, because I think he has been really instrumental in, in constructing this, uh, this site as it is. And I have to say that I know James for already, <laughs> already, my goodness, I don't want to even say, I think it's over 30 years ago, because I remember him when he actually entered the National Institute for Medical Research in London when I was a postdoc there as a PhD student, as a first PhD, fresh PhD student. So, um, so, you know, the whole thing has been working so nicely that now I, I think I can say that uh, this Barcelona site, EMBOL Barcelona, is uh, a very sort of, uh, you know, um, very close to, to, to um, uh, EMBOL's heart, I think. Um, so, um, so uh, again, you know, I mean, I just, I just don't want to, to, to say many more things, only that, uh, that indeed, as I mentioned, this uh, new program started in January 2022. Uh, the, the program um, uh, is just amazing, and you could see how Embol Barcelona is very well integrated into, into the program. But, uh, and also that uh, Embol Barcelona uh, acts as a node of inter integration and collaboration between Embol and Spain. And, and you could he hear some of the very, very interesting projects that are starting now in this, in this uh, sense, uh, James mentioned. But also with respect to Spain as a whole, um, in addition to that, as uh, you know, as you heard, EMBOL now, the new program is, has uh, wider interests and, uh, you know, uh, more um, multidisciplinary than ever. 
And uh, indeed, you know, if you think about new collaboration from MEMBOL, it was very uh, obvious that uh, indeed from the Spanish point of view, this memorandum of understanding with uh, CSIC was actually a very obvious, something very obvious to, to, to do. And, uh, and indeed, I mean, all the disciplines that uh, we have at CSIC, which run, you know, from humanities to astrophysics, going through, you know, biomedicine and everything else, can actually be a very good connection and a very good uh, uh, you know, partner for EMBOL to, 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 pursue, to pursue the new program. So um, with that, um, you know, I would just like to say again that I'm very pleased to, to, to be here for the first uh, workshop. And uh, I will just finish by uh, thanking you all and mentioning that as a Spanish delegate, I am available uh, for any, you know, question or, you know, anything that you might want to, to know or propose. Uh, so my email is anieto.umh.es, A-N-I-E-T-O uh, at uh, umh.es. And uh, thank you very much uh, again. So this, thank you, Angela. And with this, we finish this uh, so opening session in the morning, and we have now time for coffee. We are a bit uh, out of uh, schedule. So if we could make uh, a bit shorter uh, the, the coffee and be here not later than uh, half past 11. <laughs>
not a long time for the Gonna say so it's um, twenty to twelve. <laughs> Good morning, welcome back. Hello, my name is Marta Goberna. I'm a research scientist at the Spanish Institute for Agricultural and Food Research and Technology. And I'm delighted to be the chair of this uh, first session, including paired talks between researchers from EMBL and CESIC. So before the lunch break, we have a series of four speakers who will discuss about the abundance, diversity, and essential functions of microbial communities, including viruses, prokaryotes, and I think also eukaryotes, I'm not sure though, in, in various ecosystems. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Per Borg, who is the director of the EMBL site in Heidelberg. He holds a PhD in biochemistry, habilitation in theoretical biophysics, 
and he joined Envo over 30 years ago. In 2001, he became head of the department. And his fo he focuses in trying to understand the functioning and evolution of complex biological systems. And today he'll talk about the microbes inhabiting in us and in our planet. Professor Borg, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Marta, for the kind introduction. If I can have the slide and for reminding me that I'm a really old guy, so we worked for many years uh, already on the microbes. I should start by saying that the research group is in. I said. Nope. It's not much I can do wrong. Ah, okay. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah. By, by, I'm, I'm coming from a bioinformatics corner, but fell in love with microbes for for many many years, and uh, so our group is working on two major systems. Um, one is a is a gut, the human gut, and uh, the other one is a planet. So very uh, uh, modest kind of uh, ambitions here. So, and, but I see them connected because the gut is an, um, among many upcoming microbiome fields, uh, the most studied ones. Uh, it's not so complex as others like soil, etc. And as a bioinformatician, you can transfer the knowledge in one field easily to another. So, so concepts go over. Example being uh, biomarkers is a big thing in the gut, obviously, and, and bioindicators, which is a big thing in, in what we call planetary uh, biology. But there are many more analogies. So we used for many years, for almost 20 years, metagenomics, so full shotgun metagenomics to analyze uh, those. And I will go quickly through a few anecdotes along those lines. So moving to the gut first. So the, the big question and the push in funding was always the biomarkers again, and between disease and health. And so we studied as early as, you know, started in 2008, working colon cancer, thinking with low-hanging fruits, because it's intuitive that there's some connection. But it took until 2014 until we had a robust set of biomarkers, so species biomarkers. And only in 2019, we had a meta, so comparative analysis between different habitats or different, sorry, different regions. So we can now say really that the signal is common to, at least in the developed countries, being at Europe, Asia, US, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but only a couple of years ago, uh, we could transform this kind of expensive uh, uh, approach in metagenomics into a quick qPCR, cheap and industry compliant uh, uh, test set in a way. And due to COVID, only uh, a few months ago, actually, a clinical trial with the largest diagnostics company in Germany started to prove it in the hope to roll it out, at least to Germany, Germany but then beyond. So that's one story much later, and I mentioned pancreatic cancer analogous, so hope was that things go quicker after we learned our lessons. But still, it took quite some time, and I have to say, it was a collaboration with um, Nura Malatz from Madrid, CNIO here from Madrid. And, uh, 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 but then the steps indeed go further. So after the first publication, we could convince quickly researchers from all the work to do this kind of meta-analysis to show how uh, general the approach is. And, and we are working now already on a qPCR test to roll it out. I uh, should say there's nothing really in, in pancreatic cancer uh, as an early test, so it would be really important to have something there. And this, it's very promising from a microbial perspective to deliver on the, uh, on the biomarkers. So the problem is with the biomarkers that if you do association studies, there are lots of confounders. Many of the associations are indirect, and that we had to learn. And actually, over the last years, so these are the issues here. It's not only the mites, so what explains variation among people. It's not only disease that is highlighted here. Uh, the, this age-dependent uh, state, so infants are very different, compositional stage, there are lots of environment factors, a big factor being the host. So we tried really to go through all these and, and studied one by one, except the human genetics. Other people did this and could uh, and said that it's less than 2% of the effect side. The human genetics plays a minor role explaining the variation among people. So after all this, an integrated analysis, what stood out was really uh, uh, medicinal, medicinal drugs. And uh, first of all, we could show that they do have an effect. That was not clear until whatever, five years ago or seven years ago. And also that they have the largest effect of lean the known factors. So, so here we zoomed in, and uh, because these drugs were usually ignored in all these association studies. And so just to give you an idea how far you can go with simple association studies, this is a cohort of more than 2,000 people on cardiometabolic diseases, heavily drugged. 
so, um, so we could show even combinatorial effects in the top of the uh, individual effects, but even more so additive effects. Example given here is antibiotics. So people were recorded over five years, and you could see the correlation between the number of doses and just a couple of features like gene richness, but it's also species uh, richness. So if you take quite a few antibiotics courses, you lose species of your gut. Nobody, it doesn't kill you, but certainly, according to current knowledge, it's not very good for you. So you're less tolerant to all kinds of environmental factors. But also what you see, an increase of antibiotics resistance genes in those uh, remaining bugs. So they're not get, getting rid of, so useful, uh, which is also not a, not a good thing, uh, uh, because you might take another course and you might be resistant. What we can also show is that even dose matters, and that's new, the kind of quantity, and you can, all the detail can zoom in. This is shown by the color, you have different endotypes, you have a different endotype that depending on uh, how much of a drug you take. So these are, you know, lots of details uh, you can get out, but you're missing really experimental backup for all this. And here I'm very happy that, and, and Emil, Musi Heidelberg, but now also with the other sites, uh, um, uh, coming in, uh, a nice collaboration with experimental researchers. So Nassos will tell you something about the capacity of in vivo testing. Here two exams we were collaborating, or we are collaborating on, um, but also in vivo. And so again, Michael, uh, or Michi is sort of uh, setting up uh, uh, mice facilities, particularly with microbiome. But also, that's uh, uh, Jamie Hackett's example given here is just uh, if you treat male mice with antibiotics before mating, there are quite a few unwanted effects on a, on a next generation. So not sure it compares to human, but it's rather alarming what we see there, not for today. But also ex, ex vivo stuff, so basically cultivated stool uh, uh, as, a, as a closer approximation to the truth. And again, uh, Nassos will have Mich probably as well some stories on this where we collaborate on, but also back this up with what we call in Natura studies. These are the population studies. I gave you an example, but also lots of bioinformatics support that you have a nice iteration of data-driven, hypothesis-driven stuff. Just to give you an example, this is a, a, a publication that uh, came out last year driven by the Kiran Patel's group on bioaccumulation as a new interaction base between gut bugs and, and, and drugs. And in the, in the course of this pilot study, it was clear that bacteria basically influence uh, drugs by met uh, metabolization, but also bioaccumulation. The drugs, on the other hand, influence the composition of the bacteria. So you, uh, complex networks of bugs and drugs and reciprocally is emerging. And that goes back to us because we can use this using our knowledge in bioinformatics. So we have networks on interactions uh, like compound protein networks, Stitch, for many years. And now making another resource on, on the drug-bug interaction or drug-gene interactions, which then generate hypotheses that can be picked up later. So I'm very happy to have this iteration uh, in place. But with that, I don't want to go too much in the gut, but want to show that the gut is also good for the planetary uh, research. So what you see here, uh, the red dots are just uh, the GPS signals of the, of the poo collections. So and what you see here already, and we had a study on actually household effects regional effects, so city, and uh, uh, basically uh, continent, country, etc. You have the bugs have different strategies, and we could sort of show lots of patterns there. So even for what we call planetary biology, uh, the, the poo is useful in a way. So, but you can overlap this, and with other dates of data, what you see here now in blue, this is the Tara expedition. So we have been for many years in hardcore of the, of the Para, uh, Tara Foundation uh, and Tara Oceans Consortium. In dark blue, this was published in 2015, uh, five uh, uh, papers in science on very basic principles like temperature as a driver for composition in, in the ocean rather than geographic neighborhood. In lighter blue, it's a, a polar circle expedition much later. The papers are still coming out since 2020. It takes a lot of time for analysis. But also you can overlay it, and we did another analysis with collaborators uh, in, in uh, Estonia, actually, uh, the soil samples here in green. And um, so, for example, what we found there is that uh, uh, there's a global war between fungi and bacteria. Uh, we deduce it from a fact whenever you have more uh, fungi, you have less bacteria, and the, uh, the bacteria that are there have many, many more antibiotics uh, resistant genes, as I showed. So, interpreting in a way that the fungi shoot the antibiotics and the survivors are the bugs with good defense system, the, the resistance. Okay, so, so um, but 
as usual in biology, um, uh, the fields, the research is rather fragmented. There's a huge community around the ocean, around the gut, around the soil. But if you overlay those data, you see patterns, uh, uh, region patterns, for example. So the circles are what we call regional, it's a thousand kilometers, so rather rough region estimate that gene profiles and these things are similar across ecosystems. So in particular, antibiotics resistance composition uh, between soil and ocean and similar pot are more similar than two soil samples far away, even if the soil type is rather similar. So, and that effect that there's only hardly any species that thrives both in water and in soil. So there must be mechanisms go into it. And those kind of patterns come up with just some rough first indications. <clears throat> and that is one of the many um, motivations uh, why we sort of dreamed up this uh, coastline expedition Edith was introducing already, track as uh, you know, one of these transfer themes, planetary biology, um, and uh, we are look very much looking forward to this. And uh, as I said, this is not only microbes, so I zoom into microbial side uh, here, which is only a subset of the different uh, sub-project that I mentioned. Just zooming into the expedition, there's a, there's a clear plan already, so hopefully COVID allows it. Um, uh, 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 we avoid even the winter months and sort of uh, uh, forward looking. We sample soil, uh, aerosols, sediments, offshore, shallow waters, lots of uh, natural and anthropogenic gradients, uh, so lots of contextual data, and more than 100 sites. And in each site, there's a, a transect between uh, the, the deep water and inside soil, uh, inland soil. So, lots of questions. I don't want to into this that you can answer with that. A few might come back in other talks as well. Um, I just want to give uh, an idea, because we had a few pilots already, um, how quickly you get novel information. So there was a pilot, I think 2019 already, in Naples, uh, selected because of the volcanic soils and the European's most polluted river goes into the Naples Bay. Um, so this is one site with several subsites, and uh, we're just going through the, through the data, etc. Indeed, see very few species overlapping between water and, and soil, uh, but lots of genes, so you know, sort of reinforcing the patterns I have explained before. But we see a very unexpected large archibacteria biodiversity there. We found three novel orders of archibacteria, etc. And it probably makes sense because of the nutrient poor soils based on a volcanic uh, origin, in a way. But on the positive side, we also found lots of uh, uh, huge enrichment and sulfur metabolism. All makes sense. Um, uh, but lots of novel functionality associated with that. So if you dedicate it, go to such a region, you can expect enrichment of novel functionality. So if you go in biochemically. So that all needs data support. Here the bioinformatician comes back, so we prepare for this by just taking all the shotgun metagenomics data we can find. The data is easy. The tough part is the metadata, so the contextual information. Just give you an example. It's from 2000, end of 2019, 73,000 samples, still dominated by the gut, because it's a field with most funding so far. Um, but 28 billion of genes is a huge amount, and computational challenges come along with that. But here you see already that soil, which is sequenced usually deeper in the ocean, so it's not just so gut dominated. And we are still processing all kinds of data and all kinds of way have to cluster it. So what is it good for? I'll just give you one last example. Um, this is on a data set uh, from two th end of 2017, only two, billion, only 2 billion genes, 18 habitat types. It's a correlation actually also with uh, Jaime here from Madrid. Um, and uh, uh, so what you can see here, uh, 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 kind of parallel frequency. So if you plot the number of detections and the number of species or families, etc., you see these almost linear going down lines. And uh, uh, so if an evolution theory says that means uh, uh, that distribution, that there should be a neutral evolution, which we know it's not. But it implies that most genes probably evolve rather neutrally uh, of the 20 billions uh, uh, we see, or 28 billions we see by now. So that's a tough statement. So we had to uh, justify it with all kinds of analysis. So we looked at gene neighborhoods, so Operon context, where you know there's a selection on it. Uh, we checked also for, for positive uh, 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 and actually negative selection per site, per gene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the end of the day, it boils down indeed that most genes are. Uh, 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 evolving almost neutrally, and if you take a single E. coli genome, basically, I think nine, only 2% of the genes 
are rare. Every uh, E. coli is 70-80% of the genes you know, but if you take a trillion of E. coli genomes, each genome has two new genes, so that, that flips quite quickly. So it means we can sequence maybe all bacterial species on arts, but never get to the function because genes die and merge and die, etc. So those kind of very basic things you learn by just looking, having first glance on the data, and with more fine-grained data like this track, we really try to go in much more detailed. So with that, I'd like to thank a wonderful group. Um, this was pre-COVID 2019, so things have changed by now. Uh, uh, lots of collaborators on a gut, uh, lots of consortia to get the data going, internal collaboration, as I mentioned, but also on a, the, around the TARA. It's a wonderful consortium, uh, now stable for many years, uh, I think since 2008 or something. Uh, so it goes quite some back in time. Also on the track, we have an internally growing team now uh, preparing track. So I'm really much look forward, and we also passed by Spain, so with the expedition, so we have more time to just discuss to James how to go about this. Okay, that just the last statement is just on a, the concept, I repeat from the very first slide in a way, so I see the gut microbiome for diagnosis as an as a easier uh, a challenge, because you don't need to understand it mechanistically if you see clear association but also what we're going really for individualized treatment, and here you do, know, uh, do need to know mechanistically much more. And the analogy is uh, an environmental microbiota, so the bioindicators I mentioned, you know, for toxins, for pollution, but also for ecosystems, for mediation, what we are after. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor. Um, we have time for one or two questions from the audience. I'd also like to remind our colleagues follow, following the session online that they can pose questions through the chat. So, any questions, please? I was clearly too slow. <laughs> Okay, I have a question regarding the antibiotic-resistant genes. Yeah. And, of course, this will be influenced by the use of antibiotics by human beings. But, as I understand, uh, there were reports showing that you find these genes in places where we don't expect antibiotics have been before there. Okay, so they may play another alternative function. Sure. And so I just wanted to know your, your idea about this, because all this uh, the sampling will be very interesting to see where whether they are increased or whether they were there already before you yeah. went there. Or we yeah, were it's there. like almost everything in biology, nothing is black and white. So I think a big proportion is for shooting at other bug, but there might be functions, communications, whatever. But, but, we, but I didn't tell what we could pinpoint. So based on the pet global patterns, uh, we could pinpoint actually novel uh, fungi uh, uh, groups, taxa, that we pred predicted to uh, produce antibiotics because uh, uh, they were exactly in those positions where certain antibiotics resistant genes showed up. And I think we have some experimental proof by now that the prediction worked. So that gives an anecdotal evidence in the one direction, what we are after, but I completely agree there might be lots of other functions. And also, I think the knowledge on antibiotics resistance is very limited, and we can only find our knowledge and that's biased towards the human antibiotics uh, resistance indeed. So yes, there's lots of things to improve, but there's also some truth in it, at least anecdotally, uh, what I mentioned. Is this in the right direction? Yeah. Okay, so if there are no, no other questions from the audience, we proceed with our second speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Borg. So our second speaker is Dr. Manuel Delgado Vaquerizo. He's a research scientist at the Institute of Natural Resources and Agrobiology of Sevilla. And he holds a PhD in environmental sciences and he's done two consecutive postdocs in, in Australia and the United States. He's back home since two or maybe three years. Yeah. And, and so Manuel uh, performs global surveys to study the biogeography and ecological drivers of the soil microbiota. And today he will discuss the importance of conserving the soil microbiome. Thank you very much, Manuel. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here today, and thank you, Marta, for the introduction. Today, I would like to talk to you about the fundamental importance of conserving the soil microbiome. Before, I would like to state the obvious. Soil organisms, perhaps, they are not the most good-looking organisms on the planet. You know, They are rather ugly if we compare them to beautiful animals like the Iberian lynx or bees, birds, flowers. You know, It's very difficult to compete with these organisms 
but all of these organisms above and ourselves have in common that we couldn't survive without microbial communities, so they are very important. Uh, to give you a little introduction on that, as you know, soil organisms, they are the sea majority. I don't know if you are aware of this, but a teaspoon of soil contains thousands of species of bacteria and millions of individuals. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of that, but this teaspoon of soil already contains more species, more individuals of bacteria that millions of habitants have planet Earth. So it is the vast immensity of the soil microbiome. Also, they conduct almost every single ecosystem function that we know. Uh, they help us to produce food, they help us to regulate nutrient cycling, organic matter decomposition. They are, many of them are pathogens and they regulate the entrance of pathogens to the system. Also, they regulate important processes such as plant soil mutualism, like mycorrhizal fungi, for example and they are in control of climate, which is very important because they connect the soil with the atmosphere through critical processes such as soil respiration. Our own research has provided evidences that the biodiversity of soil organisms is critical for supporting multifunctionality. And I am I'm not sure if you are familiar with this term, but multifunctionality is just the capacity of a terrestrial ecosystem <coughs> to support multiple ecosystem functions in a simultaneous way. This means supporting plant productivity, supporting nutrient cycling, organic matter decomposition, plant pat uh, pat pathogen control, or antibiotic resistant control. It is very important uh, because uh, our research suggests that soil biodiversity support function and previous work, previous knowledge, suggested that soil organisms were highly functionally redundant. That means that if you lose some species in a soil, nothing happened because they are all doing the same sort of thing, but our research has proven otherwise. Back in 2016, we provided evidences that uh, the diversity of bacteria and fungi, they were positively correlated to multifunctionality across temperate ecosystems from Scotland and also across global drylands. Also, back in 2020, we found that uh, soil biodiversity, multiple as aspects, including ecological networks, the biodiversity of bacteria, the biodiversity of fungi, proteins and invertebrates, they were correlated with multifunctionality across biome from deserts to tropical forests. And of course, we have also tested this hypothesis in microcosm experiments, in greenhouse experiments, where we have found that there is a proportional effect in the biodiversity and function. So losses in biodiversity can really have an impact on the functioning of soils. Soil organisms are very important for function. Also, more recently, a few weeks ago, we published this paper where we found that soil biodiversity is also critical for maintaining the stability of terrestrial ecosystems. In particular, we found that the diversity of fungal decomposers, they can explain the stability of terrestrial ecosystems. In other words, those soils that have a larger number of species of decomposers, they also have plant communities that they are more stable in time. So soil biodiversity also play a role in the stability of terrestrial environments. Also, uh, as you know, soil organisms, they are very important for bioremediation. And I would like to show you an example from our own uh, lab. Recently, we found that earthworms, they have a huge capacity to control uh, the loads of antibiotic resistant genes in our soil. This is a very important topic because antibiotic resistant genes, they are becoming a very important biopollutant in our soils. And it is related to the way we feed our cattle and our pigs. Uh, we are providing antibiotics in the food of our animals. I'm doing that. We are actually creating a manure. These organisms are creating a manure that is full of antibiotic resistant genes associated with the bacterial communities in this manure. We then take this manure, uh, use it in our field to fertilize our crops and end up uh, contaminating, polluting all our soil. This is an issue in Spain and in countries like, for example, China. In China, we found that across an environmental gradient and also in greenhouse experiments and lab microcosm experiments, earthworms have the capacity to reduce the loads of antibiotic resistant genes. The mechanism is very simple. Earthworms, they eat a lot of soil, a huge amount of soil. And by doing that, they degrade the bacterial communities that have these antibiotic resistant genes and help to the soil to go back to more uh, normal conditions. So, Earthworm soil organisms are also important there. Also, I would like to show you another example from our lab, perhaps not the most obvious one, but it talks a little bit about how important soil organisms are for everything in our planet. 
is the capacity of solar organisms to regulate the microbiome of cultural relics. A few weeks ago, we published this paper where we found that a small subset of taxa coming from soil, a subset of actinobacteria, colembola, and the interactions of these organisms can very well explain the microbiome of these cultural relics, these tombs from the Han Dynasty to Southern years old. Tombs. So soil organisms, they are also important for the conservation of our monuments. As you can see, soil organisms are very important for very different type of functions, wide range of, of functions, and these have been recently highlighted in this report from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, where we contributed, and where they try to put together all this knowledge that scientists we are producing, uh, bring it to the general public, to the managers, so that we can start thinking about protecting our soils. This report also highlighted that soil organisms are highly vulnerable to global uh, change. Well, as you know, some species, they are actually super resistant to environmental stress, what we call extremophiles organisms, and many of them are actually resistant to what we call polystyrene conditions. They are uh, resistant to extreme climatic conditions, extreme acidity, etc., etc. We recently published this list of, ta of taxa in this review, and actually suggests that this might be the type of taxa that we may end up finding in other planets and moons of the solar system because they are super resistant type of organisms. But we also know that it is not the most common. Most soil organisms, they are actually highly vulnerable to global change. They are vulnerable to climate change. You know that the planet is getting warmer. Many places of the planet, they are suffering water shortage. Also, population is continually growing and we need to feed this population. And to feed this population, we are degrading our soils with activities such as grazing by livestock or agriculture. So, <coughs> soil microbiomes are actually quite vulnerable to all these impacts. I would like to show you a few examples coming from, from the lab. This is an example from back in 2015, where we already found that increases in aridity are negatively correlated with the biodiversity and abundance of bacteria and fungi across global drylands. As you know, aridity is a major feature in this type of ecosystem. It's the opposite to water availability. So when we reduce water availability in an ecosystem, we find less diversity and less abundance of important organisms. Also, more recently, back in 2020, we found that increases in aridity can have non-linear drastic impacts on multiple aspects of the terrestrial ecosystems. In particular, we found three levels of aridity, what we call aridity thresholds, where a small increases in aridity can have a huge impact on the functioning of terrestrial ecosystem. By that, I mean reductions in plant productivity, carbon sequestration, larger proportion of pathogens, lower proportion of uh, mutualistic organisms, so aridity, as you can say, as you can see in global dryland especially, is a major feature that controls the soil microbiome. Also, over the years, we have found that temperature and warming is very important in explaining the microbiome of our soils and especially fungal uh, communities. In this study, for example, we found that increases in temperature at the global scale, they were positively correlated to the proportion of fungal plant pathogens that live in our soils. These pathogens include, for example, Fusarium or Alternaria, that as you know, they are major pathogens that affect our crops, but also affect our plant uh, communities. So, in other words, what we found was that warmer ecosystems of the planet, they also have a larger proportion of pathogens. So it looks like a warmer world, we have more, more pathogens. We also tested the same hypothesis in a, um, in a field experiment in the center of the Iberian Peninsula, a long-term experiment, 10-year experiment, and also found that when you warm soil for 10 years, you also have a larger proportion of fungal pathogens. Also, more recently, we found that increases in temperature, they can also have a large impact, negative impact on the proportion of decomposers. And as you already know, decomposers are very important for the stability of terrestrial ecosystems. In particular, we found that increases in temperature uh, at certain level of temperature can be very important for uh, the proportion of decomposers. That at certain level of temperature, a small increases in temperature can have a strong negative effect on the proportion of decomposers, but also on our capacity to sequester carbon in the, in the soil. So, as you can say, see climate, uh, 
is very important for the soil microbiome. Also, I would like to put you an example of how humans, uh, we can actually influence the soil microbiome in a more direct way. This example is coming from a global survey that we put together a few years ago. This is the Musgonet survey, where we uh, survey urban green spaces, uh, city parks, gardens, and natural ecosystems across the globe. And what we found is that city parks, gardens, they tend to homogenize the microbiome of our soil. It is kind of expected because if you think about it, a city park in New York, Madrid, Barcelona tend to be very similar. So we are indirectly selecting this microbiome and making a very homogeneous microbiome compared to what you can find across natural ecosystems uh, across the globe. But th this, I think, I believe is a very good example of how human management can have a real impact on the soil microbiome. Because of that, because we know that soil organisms are important for function, we know that soil organisms, they are vulnerable to global change, it's time for us to start thinking about protecting this soil uh, microbiome. And we are starting to give the first steps towards soil conservation. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, starting to understand how uh, dominant taxa of bacteria and fungi, they change across the globe, and also by creating the first atlases of soil organisms. These type of atlases are very important for conservation of soil because they allow us to identify hot spots of soil biodiversity. This type of information, if you think about it, it has existed for decades for plants and animals and allow, them, allow us to identify what parts of the planet are actually more worth uh, to conserve or, or, or other priority to conserve, but we didn't have this information till very uh, recently. Part of our work in the lab is creating this type of global atlases, and we have created this first global atlas for dominant taxa of bacteria, dominant taxa of fungi in soil, important uh, invertebrates such as rotifers, uh, cyanobacteria organisms that, as you know, they are critical for carbon cycling. And also, we are now working on a new generation of global atlases, including the first global atlas of soil antibiotic resistant genes that is currently under, under revision. Even so, even when we are starting to give steps toward the conservation of soil, I would like to highlight that we are very far, unfortunately, from conserving soil organisms. Here are some of the reasons. Well, as you know, most microbial species remain unidentified. 99% of the species of bacteria, we don't know them. We don't know what they are doing. We don't know their identity. Also, recently, we found that uh, the biodiversity of plants and soil, they, they don't match at the global scale. That is an important mismatch in these two biodiversities. And this is very important because that means that we cannot protect soil biodiversity just by protecting plant diversity. Also, uh, there are important gap of knowledges in the conservation of, of soil species. We know, for example, that Iberian lynx is endangered, but we don't have this sort of information for soil organisms, which makes it very difficult to protect soil biodiversity. And finally, I would like to highlight that our conservational figure, national parks, for example, they are not designed really to protect soil. So they are designed to protect plants, to protect animals. So perhaps we are not doing a very good job with that either. With this, I would like to start finishing this presentation, just making a couple of points. The first point is that soil biodiversity is very worth to conserve, to protect food production under global change. And there are still major gap of knowledge here. For example, the interactions between crop species and microbial species and how can they help us to produce more food. That is a major unknown and we are working on this sort of question with this new global survey, the Global Crop Microbiome Survey, where we are aiming to characterize the microbiomes of the main uh, crop species across the globe. And also, I would like to make the point that conserving soil biodiversity should go beyond food production because soil organisms are essential if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, if we want to have the One Health policy, as you can see with antibiotic resistant genes, it is fundamental for human health, is critical for the sustainability of the planet. With that, I would like to leave you with a few take home messages. Soil biodiversity is critical for ecosystem function. Environmental microbiomes are vulnerable to global change. We need to reduce knowledge gaps to protect these soil microbiomes. 
and conserving soil biodiversity is essential for maintaining food production, but also the life on planet Earth. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, everybody that contributed to this work, the funding agencies, and everybody in the Biofam lab back in, in Sevilla. So thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Time for a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks, Manuel. It was a great talk, covering a huge ground on the soil from prokaryotes to, to animals in a way. But I haven't heard viruses, so both prokaryotic viruses, phages, or uh, eukaryotic viruses. So in the ocean, we learn more and more how important viruses are for the, for the ecosystem. But they are, you know, the data are just coming, and soil, I guess, is similar. So any, do you have any data or gut feeling uh, in terms of what the impact of viruses could be in the soil? Yeah, so I was kind of expecting this question, I guess, uh, and I really appreciate it. As you know, viruses are far more difficult to, you know, characterize compared to, for example, bacteria or fungi. But we are actually starting to work on that topic in soil. So we, we have this uh, global survey that we put together a few years ago and allow us to address these questions. And now we have this new version uh, that includes shotgun metagenomic data and some information on viruses. So we are actually starting to work on global patterns in viruses and so on. So hopefully very soon we have also some information on that. Thanks for the uh, very sobering uh, presentation. So, as, as I understood it, you were looking at bulk soil predominantly and the changes in bulk soil. Did you see that, or did you, have you looked at the riser plane to see if actually there's a selection difference at the riser plane, uh, you know, the interface between the plant and the soil, and, and seeing a change in the diversity that's paralleled as the, that you see in bulk soil? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. So most of the results that I showed today is true that they are coming from book soil, but we also work with rhizophers and different components of the, of the plants. And in general, at the global scale, we find like, some important correlations between the microbiomes of the but of course, like that is an enrichment toward other different uh, microbiomes. Part of the, this new project that I was uh, like, literally introducing, Global Crop Microbiome, we are actually trying to address that, that type of question because we are collecting information on rhizosphere, book soil, uh, leaf, different components of these important crops across the globe, and we'll, and we'll be providing more details about that. Okay, I would have a question myself, but I'll leave it for the discussion because we need to proceed. Thank you very much. So, our next speaker is Dr. Michael uh, Zimmerman. Uh, Michael, he holds a PhD in systems biology and uh, <coughs> from ETH Zurich. He did his postdoc at Yale University and works at the, as a group leader in EMBL since 2019. He investigates how microbial communities alter their chemical environment and how this configures the, the metabolic interactions within the microbiome and between, between the microbiome and their hosts. And today he, he will explain how we can identify biotransformation activity of bacterial strains and enzymes. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Marta, for this kind introduction. And thank Thank you very much for the to the organizer for, for the invitation uh, to come here. So following uh, the previous two speakers and given the audience, I probably don't have to make the point why microbes are, are really interesting and important. However, I want to make the point that in order to live on all the different surfaces where they occur, they need to have a, a huge metabolic um, capability. And that's exactly what we're intrigued by in the lab. And we're asking the question, how can we investigate microbial metabolism at the molecular level and at scale? And so in the first part um, of this presentation, I want to focus how do we do that um, in, in the context of the human gut um, microbiota? And more specifically, how um, our metabolic capacities of our gut microbes metabolizing xenobiotics such as medical drugs so 
when we just compare the number of genes of the microbes in our intestine compared to our human genomes, we have about 99% microbial genes and only 1% human genes. So um, in other words, we're only about 1% human. So we're, we're, we're wondering what about the two to three million microbial genes? Do they matter for drug metabolism? And to do that, we ask first the question, can we get an inventory of um, interaction between bacteria and drugs. And in order to do so, we took 271 clinical drugs that we incubated with 76 bacterial um, species and strains isolated from the human gut. We cultured them under anaerobic conditions, and then we used high throughput um, LCMS analysis um, to, to assess whether a given drug is metabolized by um, a given bacteria. And strikingly, we found that two thirds of those clinical drugs can actually get metabolized by at least one of the bacteria, which you see in this heat map, where in the y-axis you have, again, the 76 different uh, bacterial species, and on the x-axis, the 176 drugs that we found to be metabolized by at least one of the bacteria. And each square is a bacteria-drug interaction, and the brighter the square, the stronger that drug gets metabolized. If we then use this drug metabolic data and we perform hierarchical clustering across, um, along the species axis, we found that bacteria, um, that, that bacteria group themselves according to their phylogenetic proximity, which might not be that surprising. It just tells us that um, the genetic content of those bacteria um, matters for their metabolic capability. When we then do clustering according to the chemical axis, we found that um, groups of drugs clustered together um, that share chemical groups. For example, this example um, here highlighted on the very right, which are drugs that are metabolized by most gut bacteria but not proteobacteria, shown in yellow, such as E. coli, they all have a nitro or nasal group highlighted in red and blue, suggesting that those bacteria um, actually reduce those groups under anaerobic metabolic conditions. Another example, Another example is this group on the very, right, on the very left, which all actually share um, um, an ester group, suggesting that the bacteria hydrolyze um, those groups um, away. However, just looking at the parent structures of those chemicals doesn't really tell us what the bacteria do. So we were wondering, can we identify the biotransformation products um, produced by the bacteria. And to do so, we applied again metabolomics, this time untargeted metabolomics, detecting several thousand metabolic features in each of the sample. And then we asked the question, are there um, metabolites or metabolic features that specifically occur in the presence of a given drug? For example, if we incubate um, Bacteroidetes tetiota omicron, a common gut bacteria, with the calcium channel blocker, um, um, Deltaiazine, we found that out of 6,000 metabolic features, only two were specific for this condition. One is deltaiazine itself. That's a good positive control. That's what we spiked in, this, um, um, in, in these cultures. And another um, uh, peak, another uh, metabolite that was exactly 42.011 Dalton smaller, suggesting a deacetylation of the compound. We then performed this type of analysis for all bacteria um, drug pairs and calculated the mass difference between the putative metabolites and the parent drugs, which you can see here in this histogram. Um, and you can see that certain mass um, shifts occurred multiple times, suggesting that multiple drugs underwent the same um, chemical transformation by the bacteria. For example, if we look again at our minus 42.01 mass shift, which we now know is a deacetylation, we found nine hits, and all those nine hits had at least one acetyl group that could be cleaved off by the bacteria. Um, we then uh, used this data to look a little bit more into the chemistry and what we performed is a chemical group enrichment according to chemical shifts. So you see here the chemical shifts and you see here the enriched um, chemical groups and you can see our minus uh, 42.01 is enriched in carbonyls and esters, as we would expect from what I told you before. However, we also found um, 
more unexpected um, enrichment such as the opposite, where we saw an acetylation and a propanylation, and all those um, compounds actually had an aliphatic hydroxyl group, and indeed we found that those groups get conjugated with, um, with acyl groups. As we now understand more about which drugs get metabolized by which bacteria, and we got some insights in the underlying chemistry, we were wondering, can we identify the metabolic pathways of the bacteria being responsible for those biotransformation reactions? And to do so, we went to our initial pipeline, but instead of uh, screening a whole panel of different bacteria, we made genetic libraries. So we took bacteria of particular metabolic activity, we took their DNA, sheared it in pieces, cloned it into an expression vector, and then made um, expression uh, libraries where each clone expressed a random piece of DNA from our donor um, uh, bacteria. We then used those library, incubated those with drugs, and screened them by mass spectrometry to identify the gain-of-function clones of E. coli that encoded a gene being responsible for the biotransformation. You can hear, see here some results. These are um, four 384 well plates, where in each well we have an E. coli strain. And you can see here in this hair cross that only in this position here, we do have an E. coli clone that converts diltiazine to desacetyl diltiazine. After cloning um, 50,000 such clones by mass spec, we found four hits that all map back to the same genetic region, and here Bacteroidetes tetraoda omicron. We then tested this biochemically to identify that the gene BT4096 is responsible and sufficient for the deacetylation. We then also did some genetics, knocking out the gene, bringing it back to really um, drive home the point that this is the gene also in the native gut bacteria responsible for the reaction. And then we went into, um, into a mouse model, which we colonized either with um, wild type or mutant bacteria to demonstrate that this even has an impact on the pharmacokinetics once um, um, diltiazim is administered orally. Diltiazim is really just an example to, to um, illustrate our pipeline that we have established. In total, only for Bacteroidetes Theta Yoda Omicron, we identified 17 different enzymes that collectively metabolize 19 different clinical drugs. We express them all and characterize them biochemically, allowing us to make first networks of, um, um, of drug um, drugs, which you see here in the inner circle, the metabolizing gut enzymes, and then on the outer circle, the, the um, metabolites that are produced by the bacteria. As this is all based on single species, we were then asking the question, well, does knowing the enzymes that are responsible for biotransformation, does this help us to understand the metabolic activity of an entire community? And I pointed out at the beginning that in the gut we have somewhere between two and three million different genes. And to do that, we took um, the gut microbiota of 28 healthy human donors, we incubated it, uh, we grew it ex vivo, and we incubated it with diltiazim, and then followed by mass spectrometry, the production of um, the conversion product, which you can see here in the middle plot, where each line is the microbiota of a different donor. And what you can appreciate from this plot is that there's a large interpersonal variation of, in the, of person's gut microbiota capacity to metabolize diltiazine. Having now identified the gene um, allowed us to um, establish a qPCR-based assay, which quantifies the abundance of the metabolizing gene here on the x-axis. On the, on the y-axis, we plotted um, the, the production of the metabolite. And you can clearly see from the last plot that there's a fairly good um, correlation telling us that the abundance of that gene um, is uh, explaining the activity, um, the metabolic activity against diltiazim of the entire community and could uh, potentially serve as a biomarker in the future. So to sum up this um, very first part, um, I wanted to show you how we use high throughput analysis to systematically identify specific bacteria-drug interactions, and how we then go about systematically identify the metabolic enzymes responsible for drug metabolism. And that there are, once we have those genes in hand, that they could actually be used then to test whether they could be potential biomarkers, as Pear pointed them out in his presentation. 
So in the second part, I just want to give you a glimpse in how we try to um, apply our pipelines, our molecular biology pipelines, on more environmental questions. And the basis of that is really the fact that pharmaceuticals, um, they're, they're, not, they're not stopping in our body because they are also uh, released in the environment either directly from pharmaceutical production, um, through agriculture, households, and hospitals. And at the end, they end up in um, wastewater, they end up in freshwater um, streams. What is, what is important, or what, just to underline that, um, nowadays there's about 4,000 different pharmaceuticals that have been detected in water resources. And it's known that microbes are essential for the degradation of those um, pharmaceuticals. However, the molecular details are mostly unknown. And also, the degradation products are barely monitored. So um, what we were wondering is whether we can actually use our same pipelines um, on, those, uh, on this environmental thread. And here are three field campaigns that we are currently running in the lab. The first one is on wastewater treatment plants, where we ask the question, what bacteria do actually degrade pharmaceuticals in, in um, activated sludge? And can actually the engineering of the wastewater plant help to increase that degradation? Uh, we have a second project where we look at freshwater river biofilms downstream of wastewater plants to ask how is um, the biofilm composition and functions impacted by the pollutants coming um, uh, from uh, wastewater treatment plants. And then TREC was mentioned before, um, already in several talks, um, where we asked the question, what pollutant gradients exist at the land-water interface? And can we also detect biodegradation intermediates that give us insights in those biodegradation processes? So what uh, we are planning to do here, or what we are about to do, is to use that pipeline that I introduced before, um, using pharmaceuticals and putting them, incubating them uh, with different microbes, and this time not only gut microbes, but also microbes that we collect from those field campaigns and detect which are the microbes responsible for degradation. One thing we uh, pretty quickly notice is that we cannot restrict ourselves just to pharmaceuticals because a lot of the compounds in the environment are pesticides. And here with uh, great help of, of Embel Core facilities, the chemical core facility namely, we have put together um, a pesticide library of more than a thousand pesticides that have been historically used or are still in use and put them into a standard form allowing us to perform those bioassays um, that um, I explained before. So to sum up um, this, this final part, I wanted to show you how pharmaceuticals and pesticides in the environment build an increasing threat for ecosystem and eventually human health, how microbes play an important role in environmental contaminant removal, but the molecular mechanisms are barely known. And here we believe that molecular biology tools and approaches can contribute to find solution for this pollution problem. And with that, I, I would like to thank my group, in particular um, the four person working on the environmental part, Amber, uh, Jamie, Maria, and, and Richard. I would like to thank uh, a, a, a whole bunch of collaborators at Emble and, and beyond, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Any questions from the audience? Also, I wonder, I'm, I'm asking the technicians now, I'm not getting any, any questions from the chat, and there's like a message uh, here that it's probably not working. If you could check that while we're talking, please. It works? Can you see any questions in your chat? No, there are no questions. Okay. That's all I wrote. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. It was impressive. I was wondering how long does it take to do the whole process, only the part one? <coughs> it must be super long from you know, the screening until the analysis of the all products and so on. And my question is for the second part, when you're going to work with wild bacteria, with bacteria from the environment, if I understood well, you want to isolate uh, different ones, right? Uh, to the plate, let's say. Uh, how are you going to do it if most of them you cannot culture them? Yeah, this, this is a great question. Maybe start first with the, with the second question. Um, and of course, it's, it's challenging to isolate bacteria from the environment. And that's 
the reason why we like to start with the gut bacteria because there uh, we have more experience um, and there's more standard protocols to, to culture those. We use a similar trick for environmental bacteria where we started actually uh, to screen type strains that can be grown and that have even some literature reports or hints that they could be involved in, in pollutant degradation. But indeed, the ambition is to actually go um, to the environment and also isolate bacteria. Um, there, we focus first on um, activated sludge because also there, that it's, um, it's closer still to, to the gut microbiota. So there are protocols to isolate, isolate bacteria. And then we, we see how far we get with soil bacteria and biofilm bacteria where um, it, it's definitely a challenge to get bacteria into culture. And maybe the first question, how long it takes? Well, the, the answer there is it depends how, 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 many, how many compounds and how many, um, uh, how, how many um, species you want to test. OK, if I can ask a question. Uh, you showed us how um, the bacterial uh, abilities to metabolize drugs uh, somehow resemble phylogeny. Have you computed, computed whether there's a phylogenetic signal in that response? Yeah, we actually did, uh, did look this up also then in communities. And, and well, the answer there would also be it depends. There are clearly biotransformation reactions where we see a fairly good um, phylogenetic uh, conservation, but then there are other activities that are, are even strain specific and they seem to hop around even across species where it's not such a clear signal um, that is conserved across um, uh, kind of phylogenetic um, proximity. Mm -hmm. And have you found something similar for pesticide degradation or haven't looked at this that This is yet? really work in progress, so okay. we're not yet that far, but <laughs> thank you very much. keep you posted. Very interesting. Thank you very much. So, any other questions from the audience? Okay, then, uh, th thank you, Michael. We can proceed with our last speaker. She's uh, Dr. Dolores Baquet. Uh, she's a research scientist from the wonderful Institute of Marine Sciences in Barcelona. Dolores holds a PhD in biology. She did her postdoc at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies in New York, and she joined e the Institute of Marine Sciences in 1991, where she became uh, head of department for a couple of years. Um, she studies the ecology of marine viruses and develops uh, approaches to study virus-host interactions. So, marine viruses, invisible, abundant, diverse, and essential. Thank you very much, Dolores. Yes. Um, good morning. Thanks, Marta. And thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful workshop. Today, I'll talk a little bit about the ecology of marine viruses, but I will focus in the specific interactions between virus and hosts. So, uh, viruses uh, are discovered that they, are, they were very abundant and in the 90s. And um, they achieve like 10 to the 7 cell, uh, 10 to the 7 virus per milliliter that is converted in 10 to 30 in the whole ocean. They decrease in depth and distance from the shore. The size is common between 220 uh, and 200 nanomicrons, but uh, in 2003 were discovered the giant viruses that they uh, reach up to 700 nanometers and um, they could be confounded uh, with a bacteria. The, um, the most common viruses in the ocean are double-stranded DNA viruses and belong to the Caudovirales order. Um, but uh, because the, um, the knowledge of uh, the virus is increasing um, every day exponentially, uh, we know that there are many single-stranded DNA and uh, RNA viruses. Um, indeed, uh, last April just came out an, an article that say that uh, one kind of RNA viruses are, are widespread in the oceans. So, Viruses can infect all organisms in the ocean, but since bacteria are uh, of the order of 10 of 29, uh, seems like the most common uh, viruses in the ocean are bacteriophages, and uh, they are producing infections 10 to the 20, 10 to the 10, 
28 times a day. Uh, they release 10 to 9 tons of carbon that is translated in 140 gigatons of carbon per year. But uh, although we know a little bit or um, mostly that uh, viral infections in the oceans occur between um, bacteriophages and bacteria, we cannot disregard uh, viruses that infect eukaryotes. So, uh, viruses chain the particulate carbon that uh, goes from prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes to the, to the um, hydrotrophic levels after lysis and then convert this, uh, organic, uh, this particulate organic carbon in dissolved organic matter that is, um, does, that is uh, taken again by prokaryotes or other elements that are freed from the cell content like iron or another oligoelements that uh, could be used for uh, photosynthetic microorganisms for uh, photosynthetic purposes. Well, and they remove the from two to three percent of the of the biomass of phytoplankton, and from twenty to forty percent of the biomass of prokaryotes. In summary, phages in the ocean are uh, efficiently killers and um, they uh, intervene in the biogeochemical cycles, uh, not always kill, the, not always kill the, the host, and um, um, regulate their metabolisms and are considered the, the major source of gene transfer, regulating the function and diversity of the host. But, uh, to better understand the function of viruses after infection of the host and their repercussion in the ocean, it's uh, very important to know who they infect. And uh, this can be uh, looked in the, in the bull community looking for um, a putative host. But to the best uh, thing to do it is look at for spe specific viral host interactions. These studies are most focused in, again, in uh, virus that infect bacteria. And little is known about the vir viruses that infect eukaryotes. And uh, our knowledge is more biased in, in lytic viruses than in lysogenic viruses. So the central question is to know who instead whom uh, to then um, realize what is the function of these viruses after they infect the cell. I here, uh, here I, I would like to present a case of a study of um, after assessing the viral content on uncultured stramenopiles from the global ocean using single cells. In this case, um, stramenopiles are um, nanocaryotes or piconanocaryotes. They are widespread in the ocean with a cell size between two and eight micro micrometers. They are mostly free living. Here, there are, I don't know, you. an example of. Um, of uh, marine stramenopiles eating bacteria, and also there are others that are mixotrophs or phototrophs like Chrysophysia. So, first, what uh, we did was uh, to amplify the genome of the, of the cells, and then um, we look at for viral signatures in these amplified genomes. First, the um, the seawater sample is uh, introduced in the flow cytometer with sorter just uh, to mark the communities that uh, we want to separate. And then in each one of these wells, we collect one uh, single cell. The next step is to block the cell and free the DNA and then amplify this DNA by multiple displacement amplification. Each one of the genomes of each cell remains in, in each one of these wells, and then here we can sequence, annotate, and identify which each one of these uh, protists. So, thanks to the Tarotian Consortium, we were provided with uh, 65 sacks of estraminopiles from four stations, 
one in the Mediterranean Sea and four in the Indic Ocean. And it turns out that we collected 11 different Stramenopides lineages, six max, uh, three Chrysophytes, and two belonging to the families of the Cophysiae and Pelagophysiae. They are retrieved either in the DCM, well, mostly in the DCM, and also in surface. Some of them were phototrophics and the majority were heterotrophics. Then we look at, at the viral context within the, these amplified genomes. And from the 65 sacs that we got, we get uh, 37 uh, sacs with viral context and 28 without. We, sorry. Here in the y-axis, we have the number of sacs and in the x-axis, the streaminopile lineages. But uh, from these 65 sacs, we obtain 79 contigs of viruses. But it turns out that 64 of them were unique because uh, we grouped the, the ones that were redundant in one, uh, all in, in one contig and, and in one unique contig. So, the, then uh, we try to identify who they are, which viruses we, uh, we collected. And then uh, we retrieve that uh, where this, um, to classify this, uh, this uh, context from each sex, were classified measuring the genomic similarity against a set of reference genomes, uh, whether either with, with, either with uh, for viruses and host. And what we get. So it turns out that only seven of them could be affiliated to non-viral groups. Seems that there is a lack of eukaryotic viruses sequenced that are notated in the databases. And uh, we notice that less than one percent of viral protists are annotated in these databases. What is interesting of this is that uh, we recover this is V11 sequence that correspond to a maverick related viruses that um, um, belongs to the genus Mavirus and was uh, very close to the one that was isolated in a because of acid like uh, cafeteria rubergensis. So what is, um, what is, sorry. What is the genus Mavirus? The genus Mavirus belongs to a, a, is a virofetus that uh, is a double-stranded DNA viruses from the Lavida viridae family. And this um, comes from large viral dependent or associated to a giant viruses. The Mavirus was isolated from Cafeteria rubergensis that is associated to the giant virus Crov-V. And this um, here. This doesn't work. Well, here in the right side of the, of the screen, you saw the, the giant viruses that uh, has uh, 30, 30, uh, 300 nanometers and um, 7,300 kilovespers. And the small one is the Mavirus that has 60, 75 nanometers. So this Mavirus could remind, the Mavirus is the small one that is, I don't know, here. This Mavirus would remain either in the cytoplasm as exogenous, uh, that was uh, observed by Fisher and Sattel, or be attached to the chromosome of this protist. But in any case, this Mavirus does not replicate without the presence of the giant virus. What could be? So here you have the giant virus and the mavirus. And when the giant virus get the cell, um, it's created like a tra transcriptional enzymes that uh, were um, received by the mavirus. And the mavirus start to replicate very fast. So the giant virus produce a virion factory 
but the virus replicate faster than the giant virus and then reduce the abundance of the giant virus in 10 times. Sometimes or sometimes could be reduced totally. But if the MA virus is, um, is integrated in the chromosome, when the crovirus enters in the cell, there is like a, a signal that produces that the the, the MA virus that is integrated in the chromosome and receives the name of the provirus, provirophage, sorry, um, start, to, um, be lit, uh, start to be present as a MA virus in the cytoplasm and behave like before, reducing the, um, the, the, the reproduction of uh, the giant virus. This uh, is translated in that when uh, there is um, the presence of my virus, the cell will die anyway, but it's produced an abundant uh, progeny of this my virus that in a way will protect the community because there will be less giant viruses that are lytic and um, there will get uh, the cells, but uh, not in a, in a high number. In the case that uh, the um, in the case that the cells the cell is all infected by the giant virus, then all the, the there will be a, a high progeny of these uh, giant viruses that will kill all the other flagellates that they find and they infect. So, just to place where were uh, the virus that uh, we found in our in our cells, in, in, in chrysophytes and in mast, we compare with the all virophytes that were published in the literature, and turns out that our, um, our MA viruses um, that we found in the, in, in the sacs were very similar to the, um, the MA virus found in, the, in culture by, um, by Fischer and, and, he and Hegel. Here, you could find, you could see that some of them were retrieved in, um, in culture or others in metagenomes, and um, oh, one has uh, circular DNA, others has partial DNA, and the ones that are provirophages, as the one that we identify, are, have has, uh, linear uh, DNA. And um, to recognize this has um, a such of, uh, of um, genes in the extremes of the, of the, um, of the sequences of the context of the probirophage that was called terminal inverted repeats, as we will see now. Here we compare the two uh, probirophages that we found in sacs with the closest relative, that is the one um, a virus obtained by in culture, and another one that is uh, close, close, that is the, uh, the one recovered by metagenomics in the Ace Lake um, in the Antarctica. And as you can see, our uh, viruses retrieved in the sacs are very close to the to the viruses um, to the viruses isolated. Uh, for, uh, from cafeteria. So, it seems that uh, this, uh, these viruses is most spread as they thought because they only found in cafeteria, but we found in two different lineages of stramenopiles. And um, to see how um, they could be distributed, all these uh, 64 viral contexts that uh, we found for these uh, um, 30, 37 sacs, we uh, did a frame and recruitment against the Terra Oceans um, reference and catalog database in uh, two fractions, in the metagenomes that were recovered in less than 0.2 micron science fractions and in the one between 0.2 and 3 microns uh, size fractions. And this was, uh, was done in the in the in different sites in different oceans 
aquí en from, from North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Southern Ocean, Mediterranean, Red Sea, and Indian Ocean. And uh, was uh, compared in these metagenomes that were retrieved in the, um, in the surface and in the DCM. What uh, we found is the viral context were found preferentially in the metagenomic part of between uh, in the fraction of 0.23 microns and most in the DCM than in the surface. Also, some show a cosmopolitan distribution and some appear constrained to fear to few oceanic basins. And finally, the SV11, that is one that we could recognize the most with 98% uh, of uh, similarity with the mavirus that was isolated from culture, was uh, only attached or only found in the, in the major fraction between 0.2 and 3 microns, either in the surface or in the, in the, in the DCM. So, Looking at this, uh, at this uh, distribution, what we, what we could do with, um, with this, uh, with this uh, vital signature found in SACS that is translated in a, a spatial distribution, we can do the same looking at uh, temporal, um, at, at temporal metagenomes. For instance, in our insti institute, we are running um, a time series uh, since 2001, and we have metagenomes uh, since 2010. So, what we are doing now is uh, working with SACs already isolated from, from Blanes Bay, that is in the place that we are running the, the time series, and uh, then we will, when we will found the vital context, we will uh, we will do a frame recruitment in these metagenomes a long time and see if there are some viruses that uh, change seasonally or change a long time. Because uh, with viruses, it's very difficult to study global change, uh, to, to reproduce global change studies because viruses can be influenced for the, the abiotic factors, but also for the, um, for the biotic factors, because these abiotic factors also influence uh, the host. So um, I think that uh, with the acknowledge that still we have of viruses, we think that this could be a good point to start and see uh, how viruses could be influenced by the global change. So to, to take some message home, the sea is uh, full of microorganisms and also viruses that interact with them. And although viruses are very abundant in the ocean, a minute fraction of protease viruses is annotated to date. And uh, the virus protease interactions identified from sacs and recovered in metagenomes could provide their spatial and temporal distribution that then could be used also for global change studies. And here are some of uh, the people that I want to acknowledge uh, to, um, because they are, uh, they are collaborating in, in this work that I present in the future work that we are doing in our insti institute. And thanks to you for your attention. Fascinating story with a co-infection. Uh, I, I probably missed the ecological take of it. So is a, the Ma virus just a, a hitchhiker on the, on the giant virus, so very selfishy, or is it even beneficial to the host because it reduces a, a giant virus production and releases a, basically a, a weapon against it? So maybe there's even some encouragement by the host. So what's the take so far? Well, uh, and there are uh, many things to discover in this, in, in this type of thing. In this case of uh, the, the MA virus, that the one I, I uh, show you, this virus, the infection of this virus is independent to the, to the giant virus. And the virus, the small one, enters by endocytosis. The giant virus enters by phagocytosis. And then it seems like uh, there is, um, well, in an anthropogenic point of view, 
um, there is a, a protection of the, of the host, well, of the community, because the cell die right away, but seems like it's a, it's a protection of the community, and then also will intervene in the biogeochemical cycles, because if uh, they are not lies, there will be less to go in the water. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned that there is a um, distribution, different di distribution of viruses in the oceans that you find less uh, the farther you are away from the shores. And I was wondering, and, and, and also with depth, I was wondering whether that parallels or is just the opposite as the distribution of the potential hosts. Yeah. This, uh, this is very interesting. Is, is the... Um, the, the thing that I, I said you that we are studying now the the temporal incidence in this with this uh, with these uh, viral signatures in metagenomes a long time we have these metagenomes from Blanes Bay already analyzed and uh, we see if there is a seasonality of different hosts that appear along the years, or if one of the hosts will disappear. And then what we want to do is just uh, look at if viruses had something to do or is, uh, is, uh, is due because the abiotic factors related with global change is produced. I want to say that in Blanes Bay, in the last 10, the, in the last 10 years, the temperature increased significantly in surface waters. And we know we already measure the abundance of viruses in the last 10 years is reduced. So we will see when we, when we will look at the diversity what happened. Any other comments or questions? Well, if not, I think uh, we need to close the session where, uh, to try to catch up with the, with the schedule, but we can have uh, more discussions during the lunch break. So thank you very much to all four speakers. Very enticing talks.
are carried by the air around the globe. This visualization uses data from NASA satellites
Sabes que tenemos la discusión esa del final, que siempre hace un poquito de buffer. Necesitamos un, un break, ¿eh? Eh, ahí cortito. O sea, que te tendrás que cargar la discusión. Y me, Edith me ha dicho que necesita un break para hablar de una serie de cosas, un break cortito. Por eso te digo que en lugar de la discusión dices vamos a descansar un, un, un cinco o diez minutos y ya está. ¿No lo tienes? Pues lo tengo allí. Ah, vale. Bueno, es que... Hello. Okay, um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to start the session in the afternoon. Uh, my name is Isabel Ferreira, and I'm a researcher at the Spanish Institute of Oceanography, which is a national center for oceanography that has become part of uh, CERCIC recently. And I will be the chair of this session, but before I have to make a couple of announcements. The first one is that everybody please leave the badge outside when we leave. And, and then the second is that we are running um, late, so we won't have much time for discussion in this session. And we need to have a break of 10 minutes bef between this session and the next session. And we need to finish at 5 o'clock. Okay, so we're going to start the session on microbial diversity. We have uh, four uh, speakers with diverse topics. Uh, we're going to hear from plasmids to viruses to microbiomes um, or bacteria. And our first speaker today is Zamin Iqbal from EMBL, EBI, and he uh, holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Oxford. And he's, uh, he leads a computational genomics research group working on genetic variation of uh, microbes. And he's also worked on the 1000 Genomes Project at EMBL EBI. And the title of his talk today is Exploring Bacterial and Plasmid Pangenomes and Plasmid, Plasmid Movement. Please. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. It's also very exciting to be back in Spain after a long time. Uh, microphone. Microphone yeah, sure off? Or closer? Better? Thumbs up, anyone? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, then again, thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today. It's very exciting to talk to you and uh, to be in Spain. Um, I'm going to talk to you, um, roughly speaking, about uh, two things today. Um, and uh, my aim is really to give you a rough idea of what we do, some of the exciting things you can think about using um, applying bioinformatics to large-scale microbial data, um, and also explain what my group does if anyone's interested in collaborating. I mean, we, we do a range of topics, and one thing I'm trying to do is just let you know what we do. Um, and this <laughs> very simple diagram is basically meant to give you an idea that uh, the driving, the central driving things in our group are exploring bacterial diversity, trying to understand their evolution. Uh, and there is a feedback backwards and forwards between that and bioinformatics tool development, which you will see. Um, you will see in a few slides how if we pay attention to biology, we can end up with better tools. Um, and on the side, I won't be talking about this, but we do work, a lot of work on tuberculosis uh, and recently SARS-CoV-2. So, um, so first question we can ask ourselves is how can we study um, the evolution of bacteria at scale? Um, and we know that uh, almost always bacteria reproduce by binary fission. So a parent splits in two to make two children. So if we turn that backwards, that means every bacterial cell alive today can trace its family tree back, 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 maybe to the dawn of life. At least that's our model. Um, and we would like to know that, but obviously we don't have we only have contemporary data. We can't infer really anything about that um, cellular tree. But we do have genetics, and we can uh, infer a phylogenetic tree from the genomes of samples that we find today. And um, this is some kind of approximation to that cellular tree, and we use that to understand the biology of bacteria. This is no surprise to anybody here. Um, the problem, of course, is that there's a lot of DNA traffic, which doesn't care about our mental models or trees. 
Um, and so that moves between unrelated cells at, you know, in many, at many circumstances at comparable rates to mutation. So that means the evolutionary history of bacteria really isn't a tree at all. Um, there's times when it's useful and times when it's not. So uh, the next piece of work was um, driven by my postdoc, Grace Blackwell, and she wanted to study the evolution of mobile elements. And if you want to do that, there are a few things you need. You need a lot of data. You need more data than anyone, any individual PI can, can get funded and sequenced because you want data across the microbial tree of life. Um, you actually want the genomes to be processed in a uniform way. If we just suck up genomes um, produced by all kinds of different methods, then almost inevitably what you do is you find something that seems super exciting, but it's an artifact of somebody's assembly algorithm or some batch effect or some contaminant or something. So you need to look, process everything very carefully. And really what you want is the ability to scan through all of these genomes and find things that you're interested in. So uh, this is what Grace did. She collected all bacterial sequence data that had ever been sequenced, excluding um, metagenomes, from the DNA archives up until November 2018. So that's over 600,000 genomes, of which 300,000 had never been assembled before, or at least if they'd been assembled, they weren't public. Um, and after processing them very carefully and curating them and annotating for AMR, which I won't really look at, um, she found over 2,000 species in the phylogeny. That data is all public. Um, one interesting point we immediately notice is that 20 species account for 90% of this data. Okay? And that's, that tells us what we're interested in or what we fund, really. Um, like we're dominated by, I mean, three species nearly cover half of all of those genomes we've sequenced. Um, and those are obviously pathogens. Um, now, there's no, that's a perfectly justifiable thing for us to have done. We know that um, AMR has been present for many, many years. It predates um, uh, our use of antibiotics. And there are probably reservoirs of things that we don't know about yet because we haven't sampled them. And so this is somehow um, a push for us to sample more widely. And there are others here who have already been talking about sampling much more widely than, than this data set. Um, now, having got that data set, you want to use it. And you want to be able to search it, but you can't blast, because you can't blast 600,000 genomes. Um, so we had a method for doing that. So it's not as good as alignment. Um, we couldn't scale alignment up to that size. But we developed a way to do presence-absence searches. So if you have a sequence, maybe a gene that you care about, um, this would index all of these genomes and tell you which genomes did or did not have it. And that at least allows you to zoom in on the data sets of interest. Um, and do your studies. And that's, that's fine. Um, and what that allows us to do is, you know, for the first time, we were able to do huge scale search for AMR genes or for genes of interest that we didn't know, never been previously annotated. It takes a few sec couple of seconds to look for one gene. It took us a couple of weeks to look for 2,000 plasmids. And I'll come back to those um, two timelines. And so the impossible becomes possible, but then your customers are demanding. I mean, that's never enough. Um, as soon as, so we made this available on a website um, as a, a web tool, and that was great. People were able to find MDR, salmonella plasmids that they, they thought were only in salmonella, and they discovered they were in E. coli 2. Um, people were able to search for SNPs. So there's a, a study with uh, Professor Nyaki Komas from here who, where we managed to trace uh, an outbreak of tuberculosis from the Canary Islands. Um, back across the world by tracking their SNPs. Um, and that's great, but of course, the more you, once you have this available, you want to use it at scale and you want to do more. And it would really, it would really be good um, if we could do alignment. It also takes a lot of space. So 600,000 assemblies, even when you compress them, is 800 gigs of data. No one really wants to download that. And it, the search index is even bigger. It's 900 gigs. It's great that it allows you to search, but it's a lot of space. So at the point when we did this, we knew you know, we'd made a step, but it, it was not yet super usable by everybody. Um, and in particular, because of the, the pandemic, we had to disconnect our public web search. And so at the moment, people can only use this if they download all of this data. 
So in the background, we've been working on a, a new thing. So this is driven uh, by a postdoc at INRIA called uh, Karel Brinder of phylogeny-aware compression. So what's interesting is that, um, of course, despite the fact that there are pan-genomes, gen um, genomes from species Genomes from the same species are more similar than genomes from different species, and you can use this to improve compression. So if we partition the sort of space of genomes and then use uh, approximate ordering, so you, you, can see, um, you can see this phylogeny with the red lines on, what we're doing is uh, inferring an order of genomes across the phylogeny. That's, at some, in some sense, that order is meaningless. It just allows us to cluster things. And then when you do that, you can block the phylogeny into batches, order the assemblies, compress, just using standard compression techniques. And you can also use that to compress your search indexes. And when you do that, your assemblies drop from 800 gigs to 29 gigs. Your search index drops from 937 gigs to 110 gigs. So suddenly, this huge data set of you know, all sequence data up until the end of 2018 becomes usable on your laptop. You can download that. It's a pain to download 100 gigs, but, but then you can do alignment on all of this stuff. And that's the big step that we can now do. You, you basically use the search index to find out which genomes contain your gene of interest, decompress them, and do normal alignment. Um, and so you can see uh, in these um, stacked bar charts on the left, you can see the relative proportions of different genomes. And there's a tiny light blue section at the top, which are basically individual genomes for individual species that don't have much to do with anybody else. And on the far right, you can see the relative space taken in the compressed data, so that the light blue is less compressible because all of the genomes are not like each other, so they take up more of the space at the end. So that's great. Um, that's unpublished, but it should be um, pre-printed soon. And um, what this should allow is that more and more people to um, essentially get this data and explore. Um, and now, if you have the, the 2,000 plasmid search that used to take me two weeks, now takes two hours. But now we have full alignment. So if I want to explore the evolution of some kind of transposon, I can, I can go and look for it. And it's pos it will be possible for anybody to do, to do this. So I'm going to switch topic. Um, we're interested in diversity of AMR genes across the world. Um, and one of the things we do is we want to do surveillance in the community and in hospitals. And in Europe, sort of we have a perception, which is mostly true in Europe, I think, that hospitals are the riskier places for acquiring drug-resistant uh, drug infections than staying at home. So um, when people, um, when we are devising management plans for controlling AMR and the spread of AMR, a lot of it is focused around sampling in hospitals and how we deal with what we see. Now that that assumption about where AMR is may not be true globally, and we're not going to know until we sample. So we did a study uh, in Vietnam where we took two intensive care units. They're both in Hanoi. Um, so one, NHTD, has 400 admissions per year, and it's 22 beds, and the other has about 1,200. So not, not huge numbers of people. No sharing of patients or staff between hospitals. Um, and oh, we, we only sampled from June to January Okay, so that's only six months. If we did this in the hospital near where I live in Cambridge, you might get a few hundred samples, but we were, we were selecting for ESBL or CPEs. So we're selecting for resistant samples. And what we found in the end was over 4,000 samples in just six months in those two wards uh, in 406 patients. So there, we're doing time-stamped sampling um, and a huge range of species, but dominated by Klebsiella, Escherichia coli, and Abamanii. And the highlight here, really, is that there was a ridiculous amount of transmission between... Um, between let me be very, very careful about what I say. Patients showed evidence of recent transmission having happened, not necessarily that it happened in the hospital. And in fact, if you look at the genomes, even if you demand that they're identical at the SNP level, we found huge numbers of, of clusters. Um, and given the time scale that we had, it's essentially not credible for this all to have happened in the hospital. It must be happening in the community too. And if we want to build a management plan for AMR globally, we need to do it everywhere. 
and we need to be sampling in the communities as well as in hospitals. And in places like Vietnam, where there's much less regulation of um, antibiotic usage, it's clear that, oops, here's my summaries, um, colonization with multidrug resistant organisms is a major, uh, major factor in Vietnam. And we clearly have extensive transmissions driven both internally within the ICU and before. So we have an urgent need for sampling in the community. And then the last thing I want to say, this is, I, I realize that this is on my title and I've left just my final slide. Um, we're sort of developing methods for looking at uh, plasmid transmission. Plasmids are obviously a major driver for spread of drug resistance, but slip phylog sorry, SNP phylogenies are not the best way to look at them. So we've been developing methods that combine SNP detection and gene presence changes and structural changes, and combining them with information about known plasmids to, d to detect plasmid transmission in hospital data. And uh, I'll finish just by saying we're quite a diverse group. We do a bunch of things on TB, on methods, and mobile elements. Uh, yeah, happy to uh, talk to anyone who wants to talk to us. Thanks. OK, perhaps we have time for a quick question, since we're not going to have a discussion at the end. There's one question here. Great talk, Sam. Th thank you. Um, do you have any idea of the role of uh, environmental reservoirs in the ICUs as potential nodes for, for the spread of these bugs in, like, among patients? Um, do you mean environmental reservoirs inside the, inside the ICUs? Like sinks or...? So they're definitely... So we were sampling um, in, um, environmentally within the ICUs. We do see matches between... Um, between those and the patient samples. But because there was, I mean, there was no, um, essentially there were tens of different clusters of things. There was no single winner. And so we have a sporadic num amount of um, uh, matching between environmental samples and patient samples. But there was no, you couldn't conclude that the environment was a significant factor. I think, I think people have to be coming in with it. Okay, so we move to our second speaker, <clears throat> Antonio Alcami from the Center for Molecular Biology, Severo Ochoa from CESIC. And um, Antonio leads an immunity and biomics group, and he's interested in the discovery of viruses in polar and alpine ecosystems through viral metagenomics, and also understanding aerosol transmission of viruses. So okay, thank you. So, I'm going to, to talk about viruses and viral metagenomics. So the idea I have is to <clears throat> give you a feeling, a flavor of what can we get out of the viral metagenomics. And as an example, I'll, I'll talk about some studies we did in, in polar environments. So you, you already know everything you need to know about viruses with a, a good introduction from previous talks from Dolores Vaquet uh, <clears throat> about the fact that viruses are the most abundant biological entities, but we know very little about them, really. And one reason is that if we do shotgun sequencing, sequencing of, a, uh, of an environmental sample, we are going to get very few sample, uh, inform, uh, very little information about viruses because the genomes are really small. We don't have a 16S or 18S gene, gene that we can amplify, so the only way to really study viruses is, or the, main, the best way is to actually purify the virus particles away from the cells and then take these particles, extract DNA, and, and sequence. Okay. The problem is this has, brings a lot of uh, technical issues because we get a very little amount. We need to work with large volumes of sample. And at the very end, we, are, we even get only <clears throat> a few tens of nanograms to to actually do the metagenomics, so you need to amplify further. So the te technical problems, I think, are the, are, are the reason why there, is, there are not so many studies on viral metagenomics compared to uh, bacterial metagenomics these days. So what we do is we purify the particles, uh, we extract DNA, so we know the DNA or RNA is within these particles, we sequence, and what we can the information we can get is either taxonomic information, where we, we ask the, the computer, is there anything similar out there? 
or known, and we can, if we are lucky, we can actually assemble whole genomes. What I like of this methodology is that we know there will be a lot of things unknown here, okay, that we don't know, but we know that they are encapsulated within a, within a particle, so they are most likely viruses, even if we cannot identify them. Okay, so I think that's the, the advantage. Okay, so, uh, oops. Okay, so just to mention that uh, viral metagenomics really evolved and developed on, on the studies in oceans. You have heard about the, the Tara Ocean expedition. Also, in Spain, we had a similar expedition, Malaspina expedition around the world, taking samples from oceans. And lots of data have come from these projects. Uh, this paper here, I'm highlighting a recent paper in 2019, where they, they actually uh, show more than 140 viral metagenomes, and they identified 200,000 uh, new viruses, okay, so which brings the, our knowledge of viruses in the oceans uh, increases 10 or 12 fold. So that's a good example of the power of, of, of viral metagenomics and also how little we know about viruses. Just a note, uh, this paper really is about bacteriophages. Okay, so most of the viruses I described here are viruses of bacteria, which is what you find most representative in, this, in these metagenomes. Okay, and I think my personal view is that we still need a lot to do on eukaryotic viruses, as Dolores has mentioned already. Okay, but we don't know much about them. Uh, okay, so we, we went to Antarctica and the Arctic and <clears throat> were to, to do some uh, viral metagenomic studies. What we have worked in the, in the Antarctica is in Livingstone Island. This is in the, in the peninsula. Uh, this is where one of the Spanish bases is, uh, uh, Juan Carlos I Research Station. But we actually work at this end of the island. This is a very interesting area, a specially protected area, because we know that the ice was retreating over the last 8,000 years. And it has been marked as a specially protected and interesting site because uh, it's a very good place to study colonization as the ice retreats from Antarctica, from these areas. Okay, so there is lots of several lakes that show up when, when the, the ice <coughs> uh, thaws in the, in the summer. Okay, so the problem is these areas, you cannot have buildings. You have to work in the very special conditions and restricted conditions. So we actually camped there for a few weeks. We have a little igloo where we set up the lab. And what we did in one of these lakes, Lunopolar Lake, we actually purified virus particles. These are electromicroscopy uh, micrograph from these, from these samples. Uh, we have what we can identify as bacteriophages, of course, in these lakes, but there are other, other viruses out there. Okay, so we actually did this. We, we extracted DNA and RNA from these capsules, and we did the sequence. Now, uh, this is the initial study we did. Um, um, those of you who are in the field, working in the field, will realize that we use Roche technology, which is is not available anymore. That was the best technology recommended at that time, all right, because there were longer sequences. Okay, so um, the number of reads we got from each metagenome was low, more than 40,000, but I think the conclusion, and, and this illustrates well what you get even doing millions of, of sequences now with Illumina. The result is that when you sequence these, these uh, viral particles, well, the genetic DNA within these virus particles, then what you find is that most of the sequences are unknown. You go to a database, there's nothing similar there. And that's, a very, that's what you find when you do viral metagenomics wherever. And what that tells us is that uh, we don't really know much about the huge diversity of viruses is out there. Okay. So uh, the, other, the other conclusion is that we went there to Antarctica hoping that we were going to study a very simple system, not much diversity, because it's an extreme environment. And that's what we expected. The reality is that we found one of the most uh, diverse uh, metagenomes at that time. Okay, so there was a huge variability, diversity of viruses in this lake. In fact, uh, estimates were that uh, 10,000 viral species were, repres were present in this lake, while similar studies in a North American lake in a temperate place we only hold or have uh, 700 viral species, okay? So these are estimates that tell you that the diversity was really, really high, and this was really unexpected. So if we look at the viral, uh, more specific viral families, we found lots of uh, podocifo and myoviruses, which are uh, bacterial, bacteriophages, uh, which is what 
has been mainly described in viral metagenomes, but we found a high abundance of small, single-stranded, circular uh, DNA viruses. Okay, and this was not described in viral metagenomes before. Uh, uh, these were the dominant viruses in this lake, and uh, we found these are representative uh, structures of, of uh, genomic structure of these similar viruses, nanoviruses, circoviruses that we know, single stranded DNA circular viruses, but the ones we could assemble, assemble had different genomic structure, meaning that probably there were new families okay, living in this lake. And these viruses are normally defined as viruses infecting plants, uh, animals, diatoms, and fungi, so eukaryotic viruses. Okay, so we think there is a lot of eukaryotic uh, viruses in this lake, and there is lots of eukaryotes living there, okay, algae, fungi, et cetera. Uh, diatoms, etc. Uh, so this is a dynamic process. So we took sample in the spring when the, virus, the, the lake was frozen. If we go in the summer, uh, then what we found is that the composition of viruses has changed. There are more double-stranded DNA viruses, and in particular, a huge increase of Ficodna viruses, viruses of algae. And that's because the host is changing. We know that before we took this sample, there was a bloom of algae in this lake. Okay, so the viruses will come later to infect the algae. So this is a dynamic process. Okay, and this will change. But we still found a lot of the, the single-stranded DNA viruses in, in the summer. And so this, is, this study brought two questions, really. One is, why do we find so much diversity in a place where we didn't expect that? Um, I don't have an answer. If someone wants to have an idea, we can discuss it later. Uh, we have some suggestions, but I'm not sure why we have so much diversity here. Okay. And the second question is whether we are sequencing viruses that evolve independently in Antarctica. We have to remember that Antarctica is a continent that separated from the rest of the continents like 20 million years ago. So I could propose that viruses living there for 20 million years have evolved differently from the rest of the planet. Okay, there will be some connectivity, and that's another issue in ecology. Okay, where they come from, probably through the air, but uh, probably many of these viruses have evolved independently, and that's an interesting question now. How we solve this when we go to the other end of the planet, we go to the, to, to the, uh, to the Arctic, and then we ask which are the viruses we find there in freshwater lakes we are talking. We're not talking about marine samples, okay? <clears throat> so we went to, to, to the Ar Arctic. The Arctic is, is an ocean, it's not a land. So we went to Svalbard. It's one of the last pieces of land, islands uh, in, in Norway. And we could collaborate with David Pierce. Uh, uh, he was at that time, he's in, in, in UK, but he, he was had an appointment in Svalbard University, so we, we had access to the university and sampling logistics, so we went there and, and sampled several lakes. Okay, sampling here is a bit more complicated than in the Antarctica because we have polar bears around, so you need to go with a rifle. It's more complicated, but we, we managed to do it, and this is the result. We, we sampled f f six lakes uh, from Svalbard and compare the metagenomic sequences. This time we use Illumina, two, three million sequences per sample. Now we are doing 20 to 30 million reads per sample, so we are increasing the numbers, but uh, in this case we did two, three million, and the results were compared with, with metagenomic, uh, metagenomic data from other areas, Arctic Ocean, North America, Europe, Sahara, and Antarctica. And the result of this, well, this was the first uh, freshwater lake uh, metagenome, uh, metagenome described, and uh, this is the summary of the results. What we found is that uh, the Arctic lakes will, will be together, different, clearly not connected to the Antarctic lakes that will be together as well. So there is not much connectivity between the, the two poles, as we expected. Uh, there is very little con connectivity to other uh, lakes in, in the planet, even to the ocean, okay, marine Arctic, is not very much connected to the, to, to the, to the fresh water in the Arctic. Uh, I think the viruses in freshwater lakes do not like the salty flavor of, of the oceans, probably, and they are clearly different communities. Okay, so uh, there is little connectivity. We only found two genomes in, that were present uh, in, uh, in the, both poles that were very similar. Okay, there may be some connectivity 
And one possibility is uh, some birds like terns that fly from one pole to the other and may actually carry these viruses. Okay, but there is very little connectivity and they seem to have evolved differently. Okay, so we, we actually identified, as I mentioned, many of these small single-stranded DNA viruses. Uh, we had six lakes in the Arctic, nine lakes in Antarctica because we went across the, the peninsula, sampling other, other lakes. And uh, we actually repeated some of these samples with Illumina to get more, more, more data. So what we decided is to look for, try to find as many of these small circular single-stranded DNA viruses as we could from this data set. Okay, and we found is that in the computer we identified 9,500 new circular single-stranded DNA viruses in this, in this data. Okay, if you go to the database, reference database, you find just over a thousand viruses organized in 10 families. Okay, so this is an example of how these parameter genomic studies can expand our knowledge of, of viruses, in this case in polar regions. Okay, so you, we ask the computer to put all this together and, and see how they group together, okay, if they cluster. That's what is shown in the next slide. These are, we, we got, the computer gave us 108 clusters in comparison to 10 families we had before, so we multiplied by 10 the number of clusters of families. And, uh, well, the viruses, you know, is, is, is nine times higher. So these are represented here. The only clusters have a name are the ones we knew before, okay? All the other clusters are new clusters of single-stranded DNA viruses we found in these samples. If we now color in black, the every dot is a virus, all right, that they cluster together or not. We, 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 we uh, show now the, the polar viruses from Arctic Antarctica in black. Then what you see is this picture is that most of these viruses will be from polar regions. Okay, the interesting thing which I, like, I think I, we need to find out is that some of these clusters probably correspond to families which are specialized in extreme environments. Okay, it's also likely that as we sequence more metagenomes, we will find more of these single-stranded DNA viruses that will cluster with some of these, okay, or, or this here. So we will expand, the, see whether they are represented everywhere, but my feeling is that some of them will be specific of polar regions, okay, and that's something we want to, to identify. Uh, so these are the, the, the conclusions from, from what I showed you. Uh, first, viral metagenomics uh, uncovers a huge diversity of viruses that we don't know and it's a very good tool. RNA viruses, uh, we haven't, there's not much information on RNA viruses. We have done RNA viruses in the polar regions, so I don't have time to, to, to discuss this. Um, I refer to a recent paper that Dolores also mentioned last month in Science, there was a paper uh, from the Taraosians and uh, expanding the many new viruses, RNA viruses, that were, are described in this paper, but they haven't done viral metagenomics for this. What they haven't done is metatranscriptomics, and from the RNA, they identify viruses, okay, so the technology is a bit different. Okay, this is very descriptive. I think what we need to do now is to understand what's the role of viruses in driving these communities. I, that's, that's the next step, but that's what really will be interesting. Okay, and the other is, uh, point for discussion is that clearly climate change will bring uh, new viruses to humans, either through zoonosis that we are seeing with SARS, with monkeypox, or also we can argue that uh, warming and defrosting of the Arctic, or the permafrost will bring new, may bring new pathogens. Uh, some of them may be humans, if there were human people living there, and there are examples of that the smallpox was found in, in corpses in Siberia, all right? The, the DNA was cut in pieces, but there was traces of a smallpox virus in, in some corpses that were defrosting in, in Siberia. So this is something important for the future. Um, I realized this morning uh, about the, the, that really the, the, the meaning of this meeting is try to find connections between EMBL, EMBL and, and physique in environmental uh, microbiology. And I just wanted to, to mention that in CSIC we have organized many groups in what we call interdisciplinary platforms. Okay, I belong to two of those. One is the polar CSIC platform groups, all groups working in CSIC on polar regions, so different disciplines. There is lots of microbiologists there uh, are actually together, working together. Okay, so it's a nice platform. Uh, the other platform we set up as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic is the uh, global health platform. 
uh, which, which is really talking not only about COVID, but also about new pandemics, new viruses can pass to, to humans. And in, in that platform, we are very interested in, in the issue of zoonosis that may, may, may increase in the future due to climate change. So I, I think that the connection to these two platforms may be a, a good point of, of to, to start uh, finding uh, synergies in between ideas, uh, EMBL, and, and ideas we have to seek, especially because they agglutinate lots of people that are working already together. Okay, that's an idea. And just to finish, I just want to give you a flavor, flavor of what we are doing next. Okay, we've been in the Arctic, in Antarctica, and I think what we need to, 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 to study also is the, cryosphere, is the third component of the cryosphere, uh, the, the alpine regions, okay. Uh, the alpine regions will contain ice, uh, in glaciers, in, in frozen uh, water in lakes. So what we are doing is we started a, a, a project recently on one of the national parks in the Pyrenees, or the San Monte Perdido, and there what we are looking is looking for viruses in, this, in different areas of this national park, particularly in the glacier and lakes. So the question here is, is there any connectivity of with the Arctic or the Antarctica of these areas that have an ex where viruses will live in a similar uh, extreme environment where there is ice uh, and similar uh, conditions. Okay, so we, we are sampling already uh, the glacier uh, and just uh, we, we found even viruses in the, in the summit of Monte Perdido. Okay, so these are uh, bacteriophages living there at the very top of the mountain and also we had some viruses in the glacier, in the ice from the glacier. We are sequencing these samples right now, and I think there will be some of these viruses I was saying that may be connected, may be similar to, to have similar properties to, uh, to, to the uh, viruses we found in, in the polar regions, may be found in these alpine regions. That will complete, I think, the story. And just to finish, I'd like to, to acknowledge the, the work done by people in my lab. My lab, this work has been done mainly by Alberto López Bueno, Alberto Rastrojo, Daniel Aguirre, and Carlos Fernández Linares. Uh, other collaborators uh, were contributing to this. This was funded by the Spanish uh, Polar Program and the Ministry of uh, Education, uh, Science and Innovation. And at the moment, we have two projects, uh, an easy genomic project to sequence more, to get more sequence from these lakes in Antarctica and the Arctic, and we got the sequence just last week, so we have a lot of work to do. And also the, the National Park Project is funded by Fundación BBVA, and these are the people in my lab working in this project at the moment, Rafa, eh, Sergio, uh, and Carmen, Mari Carmen, and they are following this work on, on alpine regions and more uh, sequencing data on the polar regions. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Time for a question. One quick question. Anyone? Tulos. Hi, Antonio. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a curiosity. You said that there is a, a high diversity of viruses in these lakes in Antarctica, but anybody determine the, the diversity of the hosts? We, we have, yeah, we have done some 16 and 18 uh, uh, sequencing as well, okay. Um, there is quite a lot of diversity of hosts in these lakes, so you can explain that. You don't need diversity of hosts to get diversity of viruses, no, but uh, yeah, there is quite a lot of diversity there as well. Perhaps the, the, this uh, single-stranded DNA or uh, RNA viruses perhaps are linked to diatoms. On... Yeah, actually, the, the, I haven't talked about the RNA viruses, but we think that one possible host of the RNA viruses may be diatoms, probably. But the problem with the, this is one of the main limitations of uh, viral metagenomics. You get a huge amount of data. We don't even know which host is being infected by these viruses. So that's, that's a clear limitation of the methodology. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the next talk because we're late. Um, by Carlos Pedro Salio from the National Center for Biotechnology, uh, CNB-CSIC. 
Um, Carlos is a research professor and he uses metagenomic and metatranscriptomic data from marine and extreme environments to determine the ecological strategies of microorganisms. And today he has a very interesting title for his talk, uh, Time Travel in the Ocean Microbiome. Thank you, Isabel. I would like to also thank the organizers for two things. First, because they, it's given me the, the chance to listen to extremely stimulating talks and uh, seeing that many of the topics are overlapping from one talk to the other, and this will happen again with my talk. And second, because it allows me to share a crazy idea with you all. Uh, the idea is that microorganisms may be able to travel in time. And I hope that by the end of the talk, I can convince you that this idea, this crazy idea, is relevant for the topic of today's uh, meeting, that is One Health and Microbiomes. So the advantage of uh, microorganisms is that you can count them. Here we have just filtered a seawater sample on a filter. We have a stain with a dye, a fluorescent dye, and we can count how many we have. Since we know the volume that we filtered, we can calculate the concentration. And since we know the volume of the ocean, we can calculate how many cells are there in the ocean. And the number is this one. It's a one followed by 29 zeros. Let me remind you that the number of stars in our galaxy is 10 to the 11th, and the number of uh, neurons in our brain is also 10 to the 11th. So this number is truly amazing. The other thing is that we can sort of um, at least identify them through the molecular methods. This is a tree of life that has appeared already before and is already old fashioned because new uh, organisms are coming up all the time. But it's just to show you that diversity is very large. In fact, one estimate of the number of taxa of bacteria and archaea is this 10 to the 12th. This, this number seems just amazing, seems impossible. But uh, through this time travel, I think I'll, I'll convince you that it's actually possible. Uh, even if it seems it's a very large number of species, if you divide the number of cells by the number of species, you still get a lot of cells for every species. So there is plenty of room out there for all these species in terms of the number of cells. And each one of these cells has a genome, and each genome has between 1,000 and maybe 10,000 genes. So the possibilities for different functions out there is truly amazing. Uh, now, of course, not all the species are found in the same abundance. This is a rank abundance curve. What you do here is you get the most abundant species, and you put it at the beginning, at the, at the, the one. And then in the y-axis, you put the number of individuals of that species. Then you get the second one, the third one, and so on. So you find always this kind of curve. There are a few extremely abundant species and a lot of rare species, which make this tail, this long tail, uh, that we don't know how far it goes because our methods are limited, but it may go very, very far away. And this tail is the rare biosphere. Now, uh, notice that there is a difference of three orders of magnitude in the abundance. So rare can be really very rare. Now, through the um, movement of the atmosphere, the ocean circulation, the migrations of birds and um, fishes and everything, these bacteria are able to move around the planet. Uh, this, this topic has already been touched today, and I'm sure that Emilio Casamayor will talk about, about it later, but this possibility that microorganisms can move around the Earth and, find, and we can find most of them anywhere. This rare biosphere, therefore, at least potentially, could have the whole microbial diversity of the planet at any single spot. I know this is maybe going too far, but at least the possibility is out there. Now, what I want to do for the rest of the talk is to convince you that they not only travel in time, sorry, in a space, but also in time. So that this rare biosphere, this long tail of very little abundant organisms may not only include today's diversity, but also the diversity from the past. Of course, microorganisms do not have this kind of time machine but they have uh, very effective time machines. And I think the most uh, um, attractive ones are amber pieces. Uh, as you know from Jurassic Park, this has already been used in literature. Then we have rock salt, and then we have ice. I don't have time to talk about all of them. I will only show a few things about ice because I think it's the best, the best possibility. So this is a, an image of the cryosphere, which is very peculiar, but let me guide you through it. To the left of the slide, you see Antarctica, and you have the ice cap which is, uh, has a few million years of age. 
Then you have these black spots, which are glaciers, which may have a, a few thousand years. You also have the white around the continent, which is a sea ice, which usually most of it melts every year, so it has, it's a very young age. And then as you move to the northern hemisphere, you find again the Greenland ice cap, and then you find all the permafrost and the sea ice. So we have a whole diversity of frozen environments with different time cycles out there to, uh, to find microorganisms. Now, if you want to recover live microorganisms from this ice, from the cryosphere, the first thing you have to do is to show that you don't have contaminants. Of course, this, this is a basic spot for this type of research. And I'll show you just one example of a protocol that has been developed for this purpose. What you do is you get uh, some water and you seed it with uh, sensitive microbes. In this case, I think it was E. coli and one fungus. Then you make an ice core with this and your sensitive microorganisms are distributed through the ice. But then you seed the outside of the ice with resistant microbes. In this case, I think were bacillus spores and some fung fungi spores. So you have the resist resistant microorganisms on the outside and the sensitive ones throughout the uh, ice core. Then you rinse it with sodium hypo hypochlorate a couple of times, and then you melt the ice core from the outside towards the inside. So the first alloy mayor is going to have the organisms on the ice on the outside, and the last one, the ones in the inside. And the result of the experiment is this one, which is here, is the abundance of the resistant microorganisms seeded on the outside if you do not sterilize the core. Of course, you have many on the outside, and then you still have some that have been able to contaminate your samples from the inner part of the core. So th this is shows that really the contamination is a true problem. But if you look at the decontaminated ice core, you see the zeros next to the white histograms, zero, 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 zero. So your sterilization procedure was very effective. You don't have any contamination from the outside. If you look at the, one of the microorganisms from, oops, from the inside, you can see that without sterilization, um, you see, uh, actually you see the organism throughout the, the ice core. So if you look at the black histograms, the ones for the sterilized core, and you can see that you can recover these live microorganisms without contamination from the outside. Using these kind of protocols, people have gone around the world, globe, and they have isolated hundreds of different microorganisms from different parts of the cryosphere. And I'm going to show you just the, the one recovering microorganisms from the oldest ice that I have seen in the literature. This is a Beacon Valley in, in Antarctica. And the nice thing about this, um, this ice is that it comes from the headwaters. Um, and this is a, a few hundred thousand years old. But then down here, the ice really close to the surface is about 8 million years old. So this means that it's very old ice, but it's very easy to access. It's not like the Vostok core in the middle of Antarctica where drilling is really a very tough job. And if you look at the samples, well, this is a, a picture of the, of the ice seen from the headwaters towards the ocean, and it's covered by this debris, which comes from the dry valleys or taken on off by the wind. But if you drill, what you find is what you see in the other images. In the electron mi mi microscope, you see um, things that look like microbes. I mean, you don't know because this is electron microscopy, but they have the shape uh, of microbes. And then in the fluorescence um, uh, images, they have been stained with a dye for DNA, so you know that those particles have DNA. So they, it's likely that you have organisms in here. So from these samples, these uh, researchers were able to uh, detect activity. In the left graph, you can see the blue and the red lines. This show the incorporation of thymidine and leucine. So it means there was synthesis of DNA and synthesis of protein. And you also see consumption of CO2 and respiration of CO2. So there was activity. And the right-hand graph, what you see is with time, the increase in optical density. So there was not only activity, but also growth. And from this uh, growth, the researchers were able to isolate a pure culture of a bacterium in a petri dish. As you realize, it's extremely difficult to cultivate organisms from nature. We this estimate, famous estimate that 99% of the natural organisms have not been isolated in pure culture, but maybe something like that. So it's really extraordinary that this could be isolated in pure culture from a, a, an ice core that had hundreds of thousands of years of age. From the oldest one, the 8 million year old, they didn't detect all the activities. They detected some activities, not all of them, and they detected growth in increasing optical density, but they could not plate the organism. Again, no surprise, 
an 8 million year old bacterium, maybe in some kind of a resting stage or may have some uh, requirements for growth that we don't know. So it's, this is not surprising. But at any rate, what this shows is that you can have live microorganisms in very old ice. Uh, and this is extremely nice because, as I said before, the different parts of ice of the cryosphere have different time cycles. You have um, the wind, the animals taking microbes to the headwaters, precipitation takes them down, they're deposited on the ice, they are frozen, and then a few thousand years later, the ice melts when it reaches the ocean and returns this uh, happy collection of microorganisms. Some researchers have estimated that the number of microbes released every year from the cryosphere is between 10 to the 17th and 10 to the 21st, which is really a very significant number. And uh, uh, you can imagine all sorts of cycles of, uh, of this uh, thing happening. You have in the center, again, the rank abundance curve. A selection of the abundant organisms through the blue arrow will be frozen in these different parts of the cryosphere. Maybe when we had um, a snowball, snowball Earth period, maybe in permafrost, in the ice caps, in glaciers, or in sea ice. And then after some time, this um, ice melt, and through the orange arrows, it returns these microorganisms to the rare part of the biosphere. So this is happening every year, and it's been happening every year since the beginning of the planet and since the beginning of life. And of course, you can enter one of these cycles, become abundant, and then enter a second one, and become abundant, and then enter a third one. So potentially, you could go back in time to the origin of life. I realize this is too much to claim, but it's not impossible. There is a possibility that that's the case. At any rate, it's, what is true is that we have a yearly input of microbes from the past, which is enriching the biosphere today. So we knew that this rare biosphere um, collected organisms from the whole planet, so had this dimension in space, but now we see that it also has a dimension in time and is bringing back microorganisms from the past. Um, therefore, this abundance of species may be no, not a surprise because uh, extinction may, may be extremely rare. Evolution will, will be producing new species, but many of the species that would be extinguished are probably frozen in one of these parts of the cryosphere and then eventually come back and form part of the ecosystems again. And this has implications for several things. One for the, of them is our idea of the pan genome. Pan genome is all the genes that the strains of the same species have. And up to now, we knew that all these different species were distributed through space. For example, all the E. coli cells in, on Earth will share a, a pan genome. But now, we realize there's also a time event, a time uh, dimension. And these bacteria from the past, if they are able to transfer their DNA to the bacteria from the present, are going to increase this pan genome of the different species. And this has uh, implications for pathogens. So this is what I was saying about the, the One Health uh, issue. Because um, if we, for example, the virus of the, nine, the 1918 um, influenza epidemic uh, were recently reconstructed in the lab, and they were shown to be extremely, extremely uh, deadly for, for mice. Uh, the thing is that many of the human beings of the past century became resistant to influenza virus. But of course, these resistance is lost after 100 years. So if this virus, virus were, was able to come back from the past, we will be sensitive to it again. And these cycles of pathogens coming back and back and again probably have been happening through history many times. There's one um, small scale example, uh, which is uh, happening in Siberia. There was um, an anthrax epidemic, uh, I think it was at the beginning of the 20th century, more or less. And in this epidemic, many of the reindeer died of anthrax. They were allowed to freeze in the, in the permafrost. And recently, with global warming, this permafrost is melting, and the corpses are coming back to the surface, and there have been, again, uh, epidemics of anthrax. So this is a really serious concern for the possibility of uh, having uh, um, infections coming back again. So to finish, um, 30 years ago, I participated in my first Antarctic cruise. And it's a tradition, very nice tradition, that the last day of the cruise, you drink a whiskey on the rocks. And of course, the rocks are pieces, chunks of uh, iceberg, uh, sorry, uh, icebergs. And it's very nice because the, the ice from the icebergs is not like the cubes in our freezer. It has little bubbles. And these bubbles are air from the past. 
So when it melts, it makes a fizzle. It makes a very nice noise. And you're surrounded by this wonderful, wonderful landscape. You're relaxing because you finished successfully your cruise. And you're relaxing drinking this whiskey on the rocks with the ancient ice. But at the time, I didn't realize that besides drinking ancient ice, I was also drinking an ethanol thick sample of an ancient microbiota. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the nice talk. Um, time for one question. Okay. You know this works. Uh, so, all the reservoir of these bugs or microbes that come back after thousands or millions of years is the ice. So, if they don't have a chance to be frozen, they have no chance to persist to, to come back. You know, so it's restricted to bugs or microbes that can be frozen. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, there's, there are several biases. On, on the one thing, if you have to follow Antarctica, you have to be relatively close. If you are in the tropics, it's more difficult. So the sample that is collected every year by the freezers of the Earth is biased. Then there is another bias, which is the resistance of these microorganisms. So some of them will die because they're very sensitive, and some of them will be very resistant. The thing is that it's not only spore-forming organisms that have been isolated. It's also, for example, Flavobacterium, which you wouldn't think is especially resistant. And after all, we all microbiologists keep our strains in the freezer in our labs. So the Earth has been doing this for millions of years with the Earth's microbiota. But of course, it's not all of them, of course not. I'll make a quick question. Um, so, do you think that uh, studying the uh, microbes in the in the ice and from different um, ages uh, and studying their micro their genomes, can we learn about the history or, or the conditions of, of Earth and of, of that time? Yeah, this would be a fascinating topic. You know, going to a, um, a glacier and collect the microbiota every year, and then see the differences in genetics and the kind of thing. Unfortunately, I don't know enough genetics, I don't know enough evolution, and I don't know enough about modeling evolution. But somebody who has these skills, I think he has a beautiful field of research. Okay, thank you. So we close the session here, and we have a short break of 10 minutes now.
kid out of the room because this is, I mean, I'm not really a, an expert in this particular <laughs> field, but I, I'll do my best. <laughs> Have you enjoyed Madrid? Yes. So, uh, I've only been here for four. So you're staying for a while or for a few days? No, not really. Okay. It's been an interesting weekend for, for Madrid <laughs> with the Champions League final and everything. <laughs> Okay. I see in a big person. I wake up to it. Yeah. Being celebrated. Okay. Yeah. For quite a for quite a season. <coughs> um. <I'm sure. coughs> Okay, I guess we can maybe resume the workshop. So I'm Alvaro San Millan from the National Center of Biotechnology here in Madrid, and I'm going to be chairing this last session <clears throat> that is be, it's going to be uh, on uh, modeling microbe uh, behavior. So uh, I will be introducing the first speaker, that is Maria Zimmerman Kogadiva from the Embol Heidelberg. Uh, she's a group leader on multi-omics-based modeling of microbial ecosystems, and she's going to be presented a work uh, on modeling microbiota host metabolic interactions. So, Maria. Thank you very much, Alvaro, for the introduction, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this workshop. Um, is the, the present is going to get on. So, so I'm going to again shift gears back to the human gut microbiota and you have already heard uh, um, different types of research at Amble on investigating the metabolism of single gut microbes and microbial communities and in my presentation I will uh, dive deeper into our efforts to model microbiota host interactions in animal models. Hopefully my slides will get up soon. Yes, if you guys could leave the badge uh, when you exit the room, there is a box for it and it's for recycling purposes. So if you, if you remember, um, thank you very much. Sorry, Maria, back to you. Okay, perfect, thanks a lot, um, and sorry for the little delay. So as I promised, I will be talking about modeling microbiota host metabolic interactions in vivo. And just as a uh, stress, again, the importance of gut microbiota in our life. So when we are born, we are practically sterile, and we acquire microorganisms that live in and on us in the first, since the first days of life from the people we interact with, the food we consume, and the environment we live in. And healthy human body, as we heard already today, harbors hundreds to thousands of diverse microbial species, the majority of which live in the gut. And as we also heard today, gut bacteria collectively encode 100 times more genes than the human genome. And with the development of sequencing technologies and genome assemblies, 
we can now probe this genetic diversity of gut microbes and associate it with different aspects of human health, such as digestion, mental health, development of immune system, but also development of metabolic diseases, metabolism of medical drugs, and processes associated with aging. So in my research, I'm mainly focusing on the metabolic interactions between microbiota and the host, or the exchange of small molecules or metabolites within microbial communities and between microbial communities and, and, and the host. And specifically, today I'm going to talk about our efforts on understanding how and which bacteria can contribute to this microbiota host metabolic um, interplay um, in vivo. And I'm going to talk again about uh, our efforts on understanding this process in the context of medical drugs. And medical drugs are not only important um, from their physiological perspective because they can be encountered at, at, by microbiota. And as uh, Michael Timmerman talked today to, uh, already and Nasus Tipas, we now start to understand how, what is the vast interactions between microbes and drugs in vitro. But also, drugs is a convenient experimental system because they're not produced neither by the host nor by the microbes, so they can be introduced into the system in a controlled way and followed experimentally to investigate the mechanisms of microbiota host interactions. So in this project, I will talk about one specific drug, brevodine, that's uh, shown here on the top left. And this is a nucleoside analog and antiviral compound that can be converted to a conditionally toxic metabolite, bromovenylurosil, down here, or BVU, and this conversion can be performed both by the host cells and by microbiota cells. And we first showed it, confirmed it in vitro, by incubating the drug either with liver, uh, liver cells of humans or mice, um, and showed that uh, both human and mouse liver cells can convert drug to a metabolite, and also incubated this drug with fecal pellets from humans and mice, and showed that also complex gut bacterial community from these two organisms can perform the biotransformation of brevodine to BVU. So the next question we asked was, in, if, in this complex community, can we actually identify what species and how perform this uh, biotransformation of this drug? And for this, we went to the in vitro systems and incubated this drug with a panel of common human gut microbes. Um, and we saw that there was a large diversity in how fast these different microbes converted the drug to a metabolite. And uh, to our luck, uh, one of the fastest metabolizers of brevodine to BVU, shown here in this green line, was Bacteroides tetiota omicron, which is one of the common human gut bacteria. And what, why we are lucky that it was Bacteroides tetiota omicron? Because Bacteroides tetiota omicron we can manipulate in the lab genetically, and we already had an array transposing library of genetic mutants in this bacterium, which means that we could use this library to test whether any of these genetic knockouts lost the capacity to metabolize the drug to, to, uh, to its metabolic product. So in the scatter plot, you see uh, several thousands of uh, knockouts in bacteria Theta Omicron incubated with the drug, and most of them converted drug to a metabolite, but one shown here in orange, which actually didn't touch the drug. So this was an uh, insertion in the gene BT4554, um, and what we could do um, in this case, we could make a clean genetic knockout in this um, bacterium that completely lost the capacity to, to perform this biotransformation of brevodine, as shown here on the right-hand side, where wild-type and complementation uh, strains in green converted drug to metabolite, and the mutant in yellow didn't touch the drug at all. So, now having this uh, genetic um, uh, two bacteria, which are genetically identical by but one single gene, one has the capacity to metabolize the drug and another one not, we wanted to see whether this uh, capacity of microbes to metabolize the drug will also play a role in vivo. And for that, uh, we, we used the um, animal model, it's called notobiotic mice. And here is a picture of notobiotic mouse uh, facility at EMBL. So these mice are sterile, they live in these plastic bubbles, and they get everything sterilized um, 
uh, that comes into the bubble from air to food and, and water. And basically, they have no bacteria neither inside their bodies or on their bodies. And we can then use this mice to colonize them with any microbiota we want. And in this case, we colonize this mice either with a single, either with a single strain that could metabolize the drug in green or with a single strain that lost the capacity to metabolize the drug in yellow. And then we exposed these two groups of mice to brevodine and followed the kinetics of drug, and drug metabolite profiles in different tissues over time uh, after nine hours of after their uh, mouse was given the drug. And what we found that um, the levels of drug uh, shown on the top panels was much larger in the large intestine of mice colonized with the mutant bacterium um, and the large intestine and serum profiles of, of the drug metabolite was much higher concentrations of the drug, of the toxic drug metabolite in mice colonized with the wild type bacterium that could perform this conversion, uh, confirming that the single bacterial gene in the microbiota affected drug and metabolite levels in the whole animal in different tissues, both in the gut where bacteria are located, but also in the serum or systemic circulation which is, uh, basically means that uh, the whole organism body is affected by this um, drug and drug metabolites. So we wanted to quantify these processes more um, specifically, so we developed a physiology-based pharmacokinetic model that describes the major processes that are affect drug metabolism in the body and explicitly modeled microbial biotransformation in the large intestine. So when drug enters the body, it can be either absorbed from the small intestine into systemic circulation, where it can be either eliminated or at some point metabolized by the host, or the drug can go down the gastrointestinal tract and get secreted um, through the large intestine. So we described each of these processes with a, a differential equation and solved the system of ordinary differential equations for the parameters of drug absorption, uh, drug propagation, and drug metabolism of the host. So for example, this equation here shows that the uh, abundance of drug in the serum is proportional to its absorption from the small intestine, its elimination from the serum, and host drug metabolism. So we use the data from the mutant colonized mice to estimate the parameters of host uh, host-related parameters of drug metabolism, such as host metabolism of the drug, um, absorption coefficients, and propagation. Um, and then um, we use the data from mice colonized with the wild-type bacterium to estimate bacterial activity in the gut. And then with this model, we can then uh, predict how much of the microbial-produced metabolite in the gut uh, will uh, propagate down the gastrointestinal tract and how much will be absorbed into systemic circulation. So this uh, red line here is, shows the prediction of how much of microbial drug metabolized product will be absorbed into systemic circulation and together with the host uh, produced drug metabolite estimated in black from the from the data from the mutant colonized mice, we could show that our model um, accurately uh, describes, explains the differences that we observed in the toxic drug metabolite concentrations in serum between the wild type and the mutant colonized mice and allows to estimate that in this case microbes or a single microbial gene in the gut contributed 70% to the toxic drug metabolite exposure in the systemic circulation of the mouse over time. So now with this model at hand, uh, we can simulate, for example, how different parameters in the system would affect drug toxicity for brevodine in, in the mouse body. Um, and uh, here, uh, keeping the host drug metabolism con constant, we can um, simulate at different levels of microbial metabolic activity how much the, of the toxic drug metabolite product will be absorbed into systemic circulation and what will be the microbial contribution in each of these cases. And we can, of course, also vary several parameters, as in this uh, 3D plot that shows at different uh, bacterial and host coefficients of drug metaboli metabolism how much we would expect um, in the systemic circulation and how much of the metabolite product will be contributed by microbes. For example, if there is uh, almost no bacterial coefficient, then all the metabolite will be coming from the host. And if there is no, which is shown here in blue, and if there is almost no host coefficient, then the more microbiome can perform the metabolism, the more of the toxic metabolic product will be in the serum and microbial contribution will be close to 100%. Um, and the dots that you sh uh, show projected on the 3D plot actually represent uh, our 
uh, data from different types of mice colonized with different microbiota um, here in Brivogen, completely, um, completely um, with, so this is mice colonized with the wild type bacteria that I showed you before, uh, that is close to the mice colonized with a complete community. So in this case, complete community has the same transformation activity as a single strain. Um, and down here are cases where mice were actually given a different drug, which is a little bit chemi uh, which is chemically similar, but has different coefficients of host and microbial metabolism. And we see, and you see that we see drastic differences in how much of the toxic product was observed in systemic circulation and how much of it was coming from the bacterium. And the last thing that we could do with this model was explain some of the uh, differences that were uh, puzzling us at the beginning. For example, the fact that between the two mouse groups, we saw large differences in the drug metabolite profiles in the serum, but almost no, virtually no differences in the, um, in the parent drug between the two mouse groups. So what we could do, we could simulate how different parameters in our model affect the profiles of parent drug in the serum and metabolite in the serum. Um, and, um, and here you see there on the y-axis are different parameters, on the x-axis are the span of their, uh, how much they affect um, each of these metabolites. Um, and we found that indeed the parent drug is mainly affected by the host drug metabolism and is not really touched by bacteria. So um, even in, in the case of very different microbiotas, the parent drug, for Brevodine at least, the parent drug profile uh, will be not different between different mouse groups. However, um, this will be not the case for the metabolite because uh, metabolite, due to its um, different chemical structure, can be absorbed from the large intestine um, and um, and the, 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 the metabolite profile will be affected both by host and microbial uh, drug metabolism. Underlying the importance of understanding these complex processes and also the importance of looking not only on the drugs but also drug metabolites to understand different uh, interpersonal variabilities in drug toxicity and drug response in humans. So to summarize this part, I showed you that with in vitro uh, microbiology and genetics approaches combined with animal models, we could experimentally dissect host and microbiota contribution to a common uh, metabolic process, specifically in metabolism of um, antiviral drug. And uh, this data we could use then to build the physiology-based pharmacokinetic model that quantified how much microbes contribute to the toxic drug metabolite product. And finally, this model can help us to predict how different host and microbial parameters will affect metabolism of drugs for different cases. Just to give you a snapshot of the ongoing research in the lab um, and at EMBL, I want to point out that now we're moving away from the medical drugs to more um, natural compounds. For example, we have a project where we try to disentangle and also quantify microbial contribution to the host metabolism of dietary compounds um, in a general sense. And we have a collaboration process with a collaboration project with um, uh, researchers from the Technical University on, um, in Munich who are interested in fatty acid metabolism, trying to quantify microbiota contribution to the host metabolism of lipids. And uh, to sum up, their um, generally efforts at Amble to model microbiota um, uh, and, and specifically gut microbiota, I want to point out that apart from modeling microbiota host interactions, we're also looking at the modeling of metabolism of single species and its adaptations to different perturbations, such as different nutrient availability and nutrient stresses. Um, as Nasu showed you, we're working with synthetic and native microbial communities, and our goal is also to try to understand um, what are the metabolic interactions between species and microbial communities and how they uh, affect the emerging behaviors of communities because as, uh, as you have seen, microbes behave differently in the same condition, whether they're growing alone or whether they're growing together with other species. Um, and we are also uh, collaborating with uh, computational labs uh, to uh, investigate microbial community interactions in the nat natural con context, and you will hear more about that, where we try to see whether from large-scale data from cu human cohorts that um, Pierre Borg already uh, told you in the morning, um, and large-scale data sets on bacterial genomes and metagenomes um, that you've heard from uh, Zemin Iqbal, and you will hear from uh, Rob Finn later, 
uh, we're trying to see whether in this large data sets we can identify any uh, cues or hypotheses about interdependencies of microbes and communities and their metabolic interactions. And with this, I want to thank uh, my lab of um, young researchers who are embarking on this journey to understand microbial metabolism and model microbiota host interactions. Um, Michael Zimmerman, Rebecca Wegman, and Andy Goodman, people with whom I worked on this Brevodin project to quantify microbial contribution to the host drug metabolism, and of course all the collaborations, um, collaborators at uh, EMBL um, and beyond. And I'm thanking you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Well, maybe I'll ask a quick question then. So if, if, if the role of this particular uh, bacterium is um, so important for the production of this toxic uh, metabolite, so um, do you have any kind of a strategy? So there could be any way of avoiding this production? I mean, in terms of you have to give the drug to a patient, um, so it's like just decolonizing that particular bag, or are, do you have any, any ideas on how would you? Uh I mean, that, that's a very good point. So what do we do now with this knowledge, right, that microbiota can uh, contribute to the toxicity of this drug? Um, and I would say, I mean, it really depends on the drug. So in this case, we found the microbe, like the microbial species that was uh, one of the strongest colonizers, but we also saw that it was quite abundant across the, the microbiota, at least of the Western population. So literally almost everyone's microbiome will be performing this, um, uh, this about transformation of the toxic metabolite. Um, so in this case, it's, so if we find a biomarker that it only works on the part of the population, then we can potentially use it to basically stratify the patients and uh, check whether the microbe is abundant in the patient's tool and then maybe choose another drug if available. Um, if it's not possible or if almost all microbiotas contribute to the drug metabolism, then um, you'd have to at least monitor the patient, like at least you know that there is a microbial contribution and you can monitor the patient or lower the dose of drug or find other clinical solution to basically mitigate this effect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, if there are no further, ah, there's another question right there. Yeah, just a general question from the drug discovery, discovery arena. So, uh, you know, how, seeing all this and how important uh, interactions are in the, in the gut and so forth in drug metabolism, uh, what is it, well, I would like to know your opinion. How much do you think the drug industry should be, the pharmaceutical industry should be thinking about this? Um, and how should this be influencing perhaps the way we're doing and setting up our screening uh, uh, and our testing and our screening platforms for, for identification of new antimicrobials. Uh, and how much do you think this is important in terms of a clinical you know, con con uh, context? Uh, thanks a lot for this question. So I think uh, the, the evidence that we're getting in the past uh, five or a little bit more years how of microbiota, of the vast contribution that microbes can have on metabolism of medical drugs becomes more and more clear that we do have to take into account also at the drug development stage and also in the clinical settings. Of course, it will be depending on the drug um, and the disease, right? So for drugs that people are taking on a regular basis, like chronic disease, cardiometabolic disease, um, diabetes, um, for those drugs, it's probably even more important to understand uh, whether microbes are contributing for drugs that are taken on a short term, like painkiller, maybe it's a bit less important, but it really depends on whether microbes are con con potentially can contribute to severe toxic effects. Um, and I think that also the pharmacological industry are starting uh, looking into that direction and, and thinking whether it's worth to include some sort of microbiota screening in the, in the drug development uh, pipelines and patient certification uh, studies. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, okay, let's move on to the next speaker, who is Eva balsa Canto. Uh, she's a um, researcher at the Institute of Marine Research in Vigo, 
where she works on multi-scale modeling of uh, bioprocesses and biological systems. And today she's going to be presenting a study on systems biology of microbial metabolism in food biotechnology. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to be here joining you in this um, workshop. I will shift a little bit to the environment of the microorganisms. So we've seen very uh, natural environments and good microbiota environments today. But I will be focusing in an industrial environment and I will consider food fermentation. Why food fermentation? Food fermentation is a process which is led by microorganisms which are able to transform um, raw materials into food ingredients or uh, food products which are easy to digest, have uh, extended shelf life, uh, better nutritional properties. And uh, um, in industrial practice, uh, these uh, microorganisms are specifically selected to achieve certain objectives. So the first objective would be to have a consistency on the production, uh, but also guarantee food safety, sensorial properties, uh, nutritional properties, or even healthy properties. But not only microorganisms are selected, but also media. For example, now there is a growing trend uh, of using uh, agri-food wastes in order to, uh, through fermentation, produce uh, ingredients such as aroma or antibiotics that can be then used for, for example, for, for, example, sorry, for packaging, and also uh, bioactive compounds. There is also a growing trend to produce proteins that can uh, eventually replace animal proteins and can be used for feed, but also for food. So they are uh, eventually contributing to food security. So in this way, food fermentation is, sorry, <laughs> contributing to the triad in, in one health. And what are we doing in our team in relation to these uh, food fermentation processes? We are trying to build models which are uh, helping us to uh, um, gain new knowledge on the metabolic capabilities of microbial species which are being used in the food industry or have the potential to be used in the food industry. Uh, we also want to uh, be able to do predictions about their behavior so we can um, finally uh, try to contribute to design uh, novel uh, fermentation uh, processes. So there are a number of characteristics that these um, fermentation processes share that we need to take into account for the su successful modeling. So the first characteristic is that these uh, processes are mostly operated in batch or fed batch conditions, and this means that they are dynamic in nature. So microorganisms uh, are able to uh, transform substrates present in the given media and release external uh, release, uh, products to the media. Therefore, the composition of the media is changing through time, and cells need to adapt to these modifications they experience. So if we follow the dynamics of biomass through time, we will see that the cells are, ex are exposed to several phases, a uh, lag phase when they are adapting to the media, exponential phase when they can grow nicely. When the uh, nutrients are uh, uh, scarce already, there is a growth, no growth, media, the um, sorry, phase, a stationary phase, and finally uh, decay. So we need to take this into account for the modeling. The second characteristic is that the environment will change these dynamics. So we can accelerate or decelerate these dynamics manipulating the environment. And this will all not only contribute to accelerating things or modifying the, the dynamics, but also to modify the uh, final composition of the food product. And this uh, environment includes biotic factors and abiotic factors. So bi abiotic factors will include, for example, um, so this is not really working that well, sorry. Uh, temperature, the presence of oxygen, the presence of uh, specific nutrients, pH, and so on and so forth. And biotic factors will include the presence of uh, other species. So some processes are started with one single species, but many of them are started with several species, which in cooperation uh, lead to the, to the desired product. 
And the last characteristic is that secondary metabolism matters. So secondary metabolites, such as aromas, pigments, or antibiotics, are not directly involved in growth, development, and reproduction, but they are important for the ecology of the, of the species. So we need, we need to take them into account because they are strongly related to food quality. And of course, we also need to take into account that some of these secondary metabolites are species-specific, even strain-specific in some cases. Um, uh, they are also formed during the stationary phase. So we need to really uh, take into account all the phases uh, through the modeling. So how do we build uh, these models? Depending on the aim of the, model, of the modeling, uh, we will uh, be using two type of modeling approaches. So the first type of models is uh, uh, with high resolution, I would say. So we start from the genome of the uh, in species we are considering, and we build the uh, metabolic network of that species. And from that metabolic network and uh, uh, transport uh, reactions and exchange reactions, and the stoichiometric matrix of all the reactions in the metabolic network, we are able to build a first model. And this model will, of course, take into account all the reactions inside the cell. But to do so, we need to pay a price. And this means that we won't be able to uh, gather all the information related to the concentrations of the different metabolites, but only the, the fluxes. To get some information, sorry, on the fluxes, we will need to model the dynamics of the biomass and also the dynamics of the external metabolites, so substrates and products, to constrain the um, behavior of our cell, and then pose some constraints on the internal fluxes. Uh, finally, to have a unique solution, we will assume in our case that the cell is performing optimally, taking into account uh, specific, specific objectives, uh, typically in exponential phase, for example, growth maximizing uh, growth rate would be the cellular objective uh, through the uh, flux balance analysis approach. And to uh, solve this flux balance analysis, uh, analysis, we will use the COBRA toolbox. There are others, but this is well uh, established toolbox for that purpose. If we are willing to um, uh, focus on um, uh, process design, we will need uh, something which is a more coarse grain uh, type of modeling. So we will use uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, kinetic models. And in this regard, the resolution will be much lower inside the cell. Uh, but in the external part of the cell, models can, uh, can coincide. So up to now, I only mentioned the equations, but I haven't mentioned how we reconcile those equations with data. And for doing so, uh, we need to use a typically an iterative, uh, an iterative uh, procedure. It's rarely the case that we write some equations and then they work at the, at the, for the first trial. So we typically need to refine our solutions. And in this iterative procedure, we uh, require a number of mathematical methods and numerical techniques in order to test for structural properties of our equations but also to estimate kinetic parameters, for example, or biomass-related parameters from data, perform some sensitivity and identifiability analysis to measure the quality of our predictions and the uncertainty associated to those predictions, and of course, refine the solutions through optimal experimental design, for example. For a number of years, we've been working on, on several software tools which can help us to, to follow this iterative procedure and to automate the and to automate, uh, sorry, uh, model building. I'm not entering into the details. This is only a couple of tools we have developed. The first one, Gensi, is uh, focused on a structural uh, analysis of, of, of the models. And the second one, Amigo 2, uh, will help us in all the steps in the iterative uh, building uh, loop from um, uh, simulation, um, um, parameter estimation, identifiability analysis, experimental design, but also in process engineering um, uh, problems such as, for example, uh, optimizing uh, the operation conditions uh, for a given uh, purpose. 
So I will now move to a couple of examples I wanted to show you today. So the first one focuses on the development of a multi-phase and multi-objective genome scale model of yeast in batch fermentation in a rich medium. In this particular case, it's, it's related to wine production. And uh, this is the, 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 the steps uh, we, we followed to build, to, build this, to, build the, to build the model. So basically, we started from the metabolic reconstruction, uh, which is available for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a consensus model. And we needed to update it to, to be able to uh, recover, for example, the production of secondary metabolites. And uh, from there, we started to build our dynamic model describing the um, uh, physiology, so uh, everything related to, to biomass and the biomass composition, the dynamics of different metabolites, so exos, amino acids, nitrogen sources in general, and also the production of, of several uh, organic acids, aromas, uh, uh, etc. And we also accounted for the different phases the cells are uh, um, suffering or facing during, during, the, during the process. And we needed to change, of course, the objectives, the cellular objectives in the different phases for the flux balance analysis, also the constraints. But we were uh, uh, able to explain the metabolism of several uh, species already, already and several strains because they tend to, to behave uh, differently. So I'll show you an example here. So uh, here you see, for example, the uh, data against, against the model, which are the continuous lines. And these shades uh, account for the uncertainty of the model. And uh, the model was able to recover the data quite nicely. But we were also able to um, decipher uh, metabolic differences between different species. So here you have a, a, a sketch of the central carbon metabolism and the production of higher alcohols uh, for three different species. And the model brought us new knowledge, new biological knowledge. For example, we were comparing here Saccharomyces cerevisiae with cold uh, tolerant uh, yeast species uh, uh, from the um, Uvarum uh, species. And we found out that Uvarum, for example, which are tolerant, uh, cold tolerant species, are able to use a pathway which is not possible or not, or not significant for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this hadn't been uh, discovered before. So it was, it had been uh, reported for uh, cold tolerant bacteria, but not for yeast. And uh, uh, we were quite happy because that was a nice biological result. We were able to confirm later with uh, transcriptomics data. And we were also able to uh, detect that, for example, that pathway was a great contributor to the uh, um, or was uh, facilitating uh, the uh, launch of, the, of this uh, metabolic pathway in this species, mevalonate pathway, which is a precursor of lipid production, which has to do with the cold tolerance of, uh, of bacteria and also yeast species. And also, it was a group, uh, well contributed to the shikimate pathway, uh, resulting in a higher production of uh, aroma for this species. Well, there are other things, but uh, I'm not entering more into the details because I want to move uh, forward to the second example. And the second example is a, uh, um, the development of a coarse grain kinetic model of single and co-cultures taking into account the role of temperature. So basically, uh, we wanted to uh, simulate again, this is, uh, this is a food fermentation example, uh, and we wanted to, to uh, build a dynamic model which is suitable to design processes. So we needed to, uh, let's say, uh, load, uh, lower a little bit the resolution. And uh, this model accounts for growth and different mechanisms of growth with different, uh, with different substrates. Also, uh, inhibition uh, due to ethanol and inhibition to, tem to temperature. So we use this model to uh, try to explain uh, fermentations with two different species, again, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae species, and also this uh, cold tolerant uh, um, Saccharomyces cudriacevi. And uh, we were able to nicely recover the data with the model we proposed. And the model was telling us, uh, as expected, 
that uh, ethanol is a stronger inhibitor for Saccharomyces cudriacevi, and that would be one of the reasons this species is, is not found uh, in, in industrial setups, and uh, that Saccharomyces cerevisiae transport mechanisms, mechanisms are more efficient than in cudriacevi. So we thought, because these mechanisms are already included in the model, maybe we can use the model to uh, predict the behavior of co-cultures. So we tried, and... Uh, Sorry, we failed. So basically, something else was missing in our model, and it's also missing in, uh, when, when everybody says that uh, Cerevisi outcompetes other species because of its ethanol tolerance. So we completed our model with um, um, uh, uh, competitive behaviors, so species compete for substrates, and there is also some mechanisms of decay due to cell-to-cell -cell contact. And uh, we uh, were able then to recover the, to recover the data and also to uh, validate uh, the model uh, for the uh, sequential inoculation. And what we learned from the model is that both the species increase the uptake of nitrogen sources, but uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae increases transport of exos. So this is uh, an additional uh, competitive uh, um, um, advantage of Saccharomyces cerevisiae apart from the uh, expected role of ethanol. So just uh, some final messages and I conclude. Uh, models can uh, hopefully help us to integrate data and to improve our knowledge of metabolic capabilities of, of uh, yeast and bacteria in the context of industrial fermentation. But I think this type of models can also be used uh, to um, describe other, other uh, um, scenarios in which these feast farming uh, cycles are, are also present. Models, of course, need to be dynamic and need to account for environmental conditions and uh, for secondary metabolism in order to be able to recover the dynamics of the quality attributes of foods. Uh, I've presented a couple of examples on the context of high-resolution genome scale models, but also coarse grain models, which, is, which can uh, somehow uh, help us to, uh, to uh, assay or um, systematize uh, the design optimization and control. And as the well-known uh, statistician George Boch uh, used to say, all models are wrong, but some are useful, and I hope I convinced you of, of, of that uh, today. And uh, to finish, I will thank um, uh, the, the, the real, um, the ones really doing the work. So basically, David for the genome scale uh, part, uh, Artai also in the, in the mixed uh, cultures uh, modeling, uh, our long-term uh, collaborators, uh, Amparo Kerol and her team at IATA CESIC, they are the, really the ones uh, uh, with the expertise to generate the multi-omics data we are using for the modeling. Uh, the team led by Eladio Barrio at the University of Valencia, who are uh, the, the experts in uh, genetics, uh, comparative genomics and bioinformatics. And for the particular example we commented today, but also uh, um, in, we are also collaborating in other more complex um, microbiomes in the production of cheese uh, with uh, Bas Teusing and, and his team at the Free University in Amsterdam. Of course, I will take the opportunity to thank the funding and you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Eva. Um, there is time for at least one question, if you... Um... Yeah, Maria, please. Oh, sorry. There was one more. Okay. Thank you. That was uh, fascinating. And I'm really not an expert, but um, I heard, I think it was two or three years ago, we had um, a meeting where we uh, had a talk about... Um, beard production, and um, it, this was a lab who was mainly looking at genome evolution um, in different massive cultures and how, over time, they would have to go back to a previous strain because there was so much uh, genetic change. So I was just wondering to what extent um, this is something that you're also following. In other words, 
at the genetic level, are you actually seeing um, changes under certain conditions, for example, that, that are privileged? Or is that something that you're actually following at no, the same time? No, we are time? not following that. So what we are exploring is biodiversity, so sure. different species uh, running in different conditions, that's for sure. And then we also design experiments to evolve a species to obtain a specific behaviors, but we are not following. So you're not uh, doing whole genome sequencing every time? No, okay. not really. Okay, so that, I guess that's the, the next step. That's exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning, Maria. Thanks a lot. Um, very encouraging that uh, um, uh, the, the results that you showed. I was wondering, you know, when you showed that um, when you first tried to predict the core culture of the two species, it didn't work, but then you had to change the model a little bit and then uh, you could recapitulate the experimental results. So I was wondering whether, um, you know, this in, in general or in this particular case, it has to be done in a, you know, knowledge driven way. So you, you kind of think, okay, what can I add knowing the process and the biology of the process, what can I add to the model that will potentially help it recapitulate the, the results? Or whether we can also use this approach, you know, for kind of hypothesis generation where you, where you in some sort of sense um, add random effects of a scan, scan a panel of models and choose which one is best recapitulating your results and then use it as a hypothesis of what is the process that you are missing? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a mixture of both, really. So we explored in the literature, so most of the works uh, mentioned the role of ethanol, but there were some, uh, some works also uh, discussing through transcriptomics data that, that there was an enhancement in the, in the speed or in the rate uh, nitrogen was consumed, for example. And there were also some uh, works uh, talking about flocking and interaction and, and the contact to, to contact cell. So this is something we, we added to the, to, the, to the model because there was previous evidence that those mechanisms uh, could be there. And we also, uh, because of the nitrogen um, uh, speed up uh, of, of, uh, or uptake speed up, we also decided to include exos uh, mechanisms and uh, also to um, affect lag phase. But this was kind of intuition driven. So we basically uh, uh, use this iterative procedure to um, select the right mechanisms and what, uh, 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 what we, what we uh, uh, end up uh, having at the end is hopefully uh, the, the, the real mechanisms involved. But we, we, we really need to incorporate several mechanisms and then to run this iterative procedure to come up with the best compromise between the detailed in the data and, and detailed in the model. Thank you. So this is the learning kind of process. Okay, thank you very much, Eva. Um, let's move on to the next speaker, who's um, Rob Finn, uh, who's a researcher at the EMBL EBI in Kingston. He leads the microbiome informatics team working on computational metagenomics. And uh, he will be presenting a work on multi-kingdom genome resolve metagenomics from different environments. <coughs> okay. Oh, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for the really enjoyable day of talks. Um, I'm the last one from EMBL, and hopefully I won't disappoint. So I'm slightly different to the other, other uh, people who have spoken to today in the fact that I run both a research team and a service team. And really what I wanted to illustrate is how we bring those two things together, as well as interactions with the community to try and establish these multi-kingdom resolved uh, metagenomics uh, catalogues from different environments. So the resource I look after, a database, is called Magnify. Uh, it's a free-to-use resource. And, it, and what we do is assemble uh, and analyze metagenomics data as much as possible, depending on the type. But we also make sure that we archive it as part of the process of the data coming to us in the European Nucleotide Archive, therefore capturing the metadata that's associated with it. So we have this big role to not only have the data archiving, the analysis, but we want to make sure that these uh, data sets are uh, analyzed in a systematic way so that they become more comparable. I'm not going to go through the website page by page, you'll be pleased to know, but what I am going to do is show you some of the things that we do 
and how we're beginning to move more and more to genome-resolved metagenomics. So what do I mean by that? Well, typically metagenomics, maybe five, ten years ago, was all about short-read data sets coming from Illumina. We could only really analyze those. It really didn't give you an idea of, you know, what a single organism could do. Uh, in 2018, uh, I introduced the notion of actually assembly as a service in Magnify. And so now we take short read data sets and assemble those. And once we have those assembled contigs, we push those into ENA. We can also do the functional profiling on the raw read still, but we are now pushing more and more to do this assembly. We can get taxonomic profiles out. But where we're now going is where my research team has led, and now we're putting it into production. And this is going from those assembled contigs through to what we think is a genome. And I'm going to start off in the bacterial space. So here's an overview of what we do. So we group contigs, a process called binning, where we think those contigs have all come from the same organism. We estimate quality. We use tools produced by both the Bort group, so we use something called Gunk. We also use something that's widely used in the community called CheckM, which uses single mark copy marker genes to est estimate completeness and contamination. Using those tools, we can often refine those bins, and then we have a set of what we then dereplicate to a set that we call as MAGs. So MAGs is a metagenome assembled genome, and I'm sorry, I will slip into calling them MAGs very quickly. We push those data sets into ENA, where they may be study specific, and then we aggregate both the MAGs we generate and those submitted by the community into the right layer into the ENA archive to give reference catalogs. And that's what we then take through and display in Magnify. So what does that look like? I'm going to start off in the human gut microbiome because I'm at EMBL, and that's where we always have to talk about human gut microbiome. So we started uh, by analyzing 12,000 human gut metagenomic data sets. We assembled those, and using that process I just illustrated, we identified nearly 2,000 non-redundant species representatives. We weren't the only group doing this. There were two other papers coming out at the same time. And rather than arguing whose data set was best, we actually pulled all of these data sets together and actually were able to not only show that what we were doing, although there were different groups, was highly reproducible, but we could actually say where it was reproducible was where we had common data sets, where we differed was actually where we had unique data sets. And bringing that all together, we had just over 4,500 species representatives. This is the most comprehensive catalogue of the human gut microbiome. On the right-hand side, you can see a phylogenetic tree of those near, uh, well, the 4,500 species. Coming off the tips of that phylogenetic tree are two different colours. There, there's the, what well, you can predominantly see is two different colours. There's the blue and then the green. The blue are genomes that have been cultured from the gut, and the green are those that are yet to be cultured. And what you can see, hopefully, is that this is dominated by uncultured organisms. And actually, those that are cultured are actually punctuated in groups across that phylogenetic tree. Around the outside of that phylogenetic tree is an indication of the phylum that they're coming from. And then further out, you'll see these whiskers coming off, which is the number of times we observed that genome. And although there's isolate genomes, these are where we assembled them de novo and have an exact match. In total, that entire collection was 210,000 bacterial genomes, and it encoded 170 million proteins. That's as big as databases like Uniprot are on their own. But we then can just have these representatives, and that's what we make available through the Magnify resource. So what can we do with these? There are many things. I'm just going to give one simple example of the things we could do. And one of the questions we simply wanted to know is, why haven't these organisms been cultured yet? So what we could do is, having got these genomes as a whole, we can start analysing their metabolic potential. And here what we've got are effect plots where we've grouped per phyler uncultured versus cultured species and said, OK, which functions are enriched in one versus the other? And what we found is that in the uncultured set, consistently functions to deal with oxygen were depleted. And so... Uh, going back to the whisker plot, 
Mags are typically less abundant than those that have been isolated and seem to be far more sensitive to oxygen. And that's why we think is fundamentally why we haven't been able to uh, see them in the culturing efforts. And now we can use this information to actually guide culturing experiments. But I'm going to end the story there on, on bacteria and then turn to what else do these metagenomes contain. So we've already heard about viruses today. So we went and looked about viruses, and these are all going to be uh, phages. So we took a collection of isolate genomes from the gut microbiome and metagenomes. We then have a, a process of using VeerFinder and VeerSorter and a tool called Verify, which is a workflow which I'll introduce on the next slide, to try and identify those contigs which were believed to be phage. This will both have prophage that are integrated as well as the free phage. And then we applied a lot of quality control different measures. We used length filtering, we used a tool called CheckM, we also developed a neural network to try and help us identify those key genes that really do make up a phage. And that allowed us to produce the gut phage database. Using this approach, we identified over 142,000 quasi-species, which are all over 10 kb in length. So th this Verify uh, pipeline, this is a quick overview. And again, in the interest of time and trying to keep to time, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We have a whole workflow. And this workflow is available for everyone. Uh, there's a workflow hub. I should have put the address here. Uh, of where, where you can get that, but if you're interested, please reach out to me. But what we have uh, is we've worked with a, a group uh, to actually come up with a set of viral-specific uh, marker genes called VeerFox, and that's what we're doing in this uh, pink box on the right-hand side, is we use those to try and inform what are the tax, tax, taxa that that phage belongs to. I must admit, a lot of that still remains unknown, but we can start pigeonholing these into different levels, and that's what we've used. So in terms of that 140,000, was there anything interesting in that? And again, I'm just going to pick one highlight. So one of the things that we looked for is we clustered all of that 140,000 uh, quasi-species and then looked for the, the uh, numbers of genomes per viral cluster. And on the left-hand side, we have the viral uh, cluster ranking and then the number of genomes that was found. For those who are familiar to the gut microbiome, the, the crass phage is one of the most abundant genomes and it's been well documented. The next most abundant was a novel cluster, which we termed guberphage. It's related to the uh, crass phage. And on the right, far right-hand side, you can see a phylogenetic tree so here are all of the subdivisions of the uh, crass phage, but then coming off on this long branch is the guberphage, and it is a distinct group. When we look at the distribution of this, what we find is actually, it's actually very common in European populations. It's surprisingly uncommon in North American populations, because here we've got the sampling bias. And then as we go account for that sampling bias, uh, as shown in the middle, that actually you do find this across all geographic uh, sampled regions. So this is a highly abundant phage, yet we didn't even know it existed until we performed this analysis. Right, so I've done bacteria, I've done phage. What about eukaryotic genomes? So eukaryotic genomes in metagenomes are, are typically much harder because they are lower abundant they're bigger genomes, they tend to be more complex. Often they can be experimentally excluded either by size fractionation or the extraction methods. But we still felt that actually those techniques should be applicable. So what we wanted to do is understand why we typically not seeing eukaryotic genomes. That initial workflow, I had mentioned that CheckM was used as a marker gene. And what we find is that's very bacterial. Well, what we know is that's very bacterial specific. So we wanted to start asking the question. And when we started developing a tool to try and assess completeness and contamination, we found that actually eukaryotic genomes don't just bin out into one grouping. And, and what, we do, what we did to establish what's actually going on was actually go back to a very simple metagenome. So this is actually a kombucha metagenome. And there are two bins that are associated with the well-known eukaryotic species. 
what we were trying to do is understand why. So normally, when you're going through binning, you're using composition and coverage to actually separate those, those contigs into grouping. On the left-hand side, we've got GC plotted against coverage. The two bins that we know map to this genome are colored red and blue. And what you can see is these just overlap. The rest of the other species, the bacterial species. When we then actually uh, look at how these bin out, we were thinking, okay, so what, how are the tools functioning? So we use a tool called, called Concoct because it has no prior assumption about actually what it's dealing with. And what you have is, you, we've illustrated here a Tisney plot, and actually what you see is the blue and red actually separate out slightly. That Concoct uses a Gaussian function to actually understand where those, those bins should be. And what it is, is that the, the Gaussian function can't encapsulate all of this density because of the size of the genome. So what we do is once, once we started working out what was going on, we could then map that back. And we don't see actually that it's specific to chromosomes or anything like that. They're completely interleaved. And we see this over and over again, that actually there's no real reason why these aren't bin together. It's just that tools can't get there. So what can we do? So we established a tool called UCC. This is a bit like CheckM. So the first version was just about having a set of marker genes to allow you to estimate the completeness and contamination. Eukaryotic genomes are more complicated, so it's not just one set of marker genes. We have to do multiple rounds to assign a set of marker genes. So we do a first pass, work out roughly where the genome is, and then try and understand. But what could we do to actually try and bring the split bins back together again. So using this tool, uh, we could actually start going through and looking at initially the, the big bins, so those that are already estimated to be at least 50% complete, and then going through using uh, a mixture of information to try and identify this missing other bin. So we use a, a number of pieces of information. One is the fact that we look for paired ends that bridge across contigs that are found across the two different bins. And then what we also do is we then look for an improvement in uh, completeness without affecting uh, contamination. And here's an illustration of essentially how the tool's working. So here, the, the, the primary bin is in blue. The secondary bin, or the, the split bin, is in yellow. We, we identify more than 100 paired end reads we bring that in together. We then can estimate that there's, no, there's an increase in completeness without impacting contamination particularly. And then we can compare that in some cases to the reference and actually identify that yes, this works. And we can do lots of analysis and we have done that. And what we find is that when we compare uh, average nucleotide identity of the primary and secondary bin against the reference, they are very closely aligned. If we look at the fraction that can be of the, the bin that can be uh, aligned to that reference, again, the fraction of that bin is very high. And then if we look at the A and I of the primary bin versus secondary, they have a very high correlation. And this has given us lots of confidence that what actually we've done is actually find a way to bring this information back together again. So we've done this at scale. Uh, we've applied this to all of the uh, assemblies in Magnify. So we took the 26,000 assemblies at the time. We looked for those data set assemblies with more than five megabase of DNA in the assembly and then ran UCC on all of those. Using that approach, we identified five, uh, 751 genomes. And when we dereplicate those, 124 unique species, of which 58 were novel. I'm not going to go through this, this uh, whole uh, phylogenetic tree explaining. What we will say is that we can identify lots of different eukaryotic genomes across different environments. And then when we take those genomes back and compare them to uh, data sets where we weren't able to assemble them, but we knew there was a large fraction of, of uh, eukaryotic DNA, we could then have enough of, of information to actually say, yes, that genome is present. There's, to, to really just illustrate what we've been able to do in a more simplified version is if we just look at the human skin microbiome, on the left-hand side, we've got a, a tree. Now, the skin microbiome is particularly well-studied, so there's lots of isolates we can compare to. So in this particular example, we pull out all of the uh, de novo metagenomed assembled genomes 
are in blue, and then the corresponding isolates are in red as much as possible. We put it in that tree. So for some of those, you can see that the, the branch length is very, very short, and that's because they're equivalent species. So we've actually covered something de novo that's equivalent to um, the isolate. But there are a number of those that are referred to as novel, where there is no corresponding um, genome. And again, this illustrates that we're carrying these microbes around. These, this skin is really well studied, yet we can still find many novel things. Even those three novel uh, mags that we have through that tree, which we've called uh, Rara, Palmer, and uh, Aureus, the Palmer, it will give you no uh, it will surprise that it's predominantly found on the hands. Rara is very rare. And actually, if we start on the right-hand side, you can start seeing the distribution across the different uh, samples and body sites. So the Aureus is found on most people across most body sites. And then the next one along is found on fewer people, um, but across all body sites. Uh, and then the rare one is just on a handful of individuals. It is on just like two individuals. And they actually happen to be in the same household. So we use this, this approach. And I thought I'd just finish up by, by illustrating an example where we're using this in, in, in food production and looking uh, at chicken catalog, so specifically cecum. And actually, this is a uh, project that is partly taking place in Spain. So we've uh, worked with, uh, in a part of a European project called Hollow Foods. We've taken 261 cecum samples. We've uh, run all of our pipelines on those data sets and identified 825 representative species, which is shown in the, the, the uh, phylogenetic tree on the right-hand side. Uh, three of those are archaea, the rest are uh, uh, prokaryotes, or sorry, bacteria. 570 of those do not match anything that's in the reference databases. We've got one blastocyst, so I've not really shown a phylogenetic tree for that, so one eukaryotic. And then we have phage sequences galore, most of which we can't actually say what they do. But we do know that there are over 5,000 proviral se sequences with 20, 20, uh, 2,050 species. 40,000 phage, uh, where we can cluster those down to nearly 8,500 species. So that just gives you now, we have these, these pipelines, we can apply them everywhere. We can start looking at the total fraction. So if we read map the raw reads back up onto just the uh, prokaryotic fraction, what we see is that now in a metagenome, we can probably account for nearly 80% of all the reads, which is pretty high. And we can start looking at abundance and start mapping that with the metadata, which is shown at the top. So what's the next challenge? The only thing I haven't covered really is plasmids. I'm not going to go through this slide in too much detail, but we are beginning to think about this and how we can try and actually pull plasmids out of metagenomes. Associating them with taxonomy is just uh, its a bit of a lottery, really. You might as well flip a coin as much as it works. Um, but we do see functions that we would expect on those plasmid sequences. So that really gives you a flavor of the next challenge. Just really thought I'd just finish up by saying we also work in the community. Um, so in Baobao, we have a conference as part of that hollow food. That's happening in September. And we are also conducting training before that conference on these pipelines on how we achieve these metagenomic multi-kingdom Result, genome resolved catalogs. And as always, I have a very important team that back me up that are shown on the left hand side. And all of this work is done through collaborations within the community. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, there is time for one quick question. Or maybe I'll ask them. Um, I was wondering, just for plasmids, it's kind of difficult to infer, or, or like the host. What about for phages? Can you can you tell? Uh, so your best chance with that is find looking for the uh, going through the uh, CRISPR spacer elements and trying to find matches. Okay. That or finding it as a prophage in a, in a in a something you've got as a mag. It's, it's really hard. In, okay. in all honesty, I think. 
I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so uh, let's move to the last talk of the session and of the day. Um, it will be um, Emilio Ortega from the Center for Advanced Studies in, in Blanes. Uh, he works in uh, integrative freshwater ecology and he will be presenting um, this talk um, titled Understanding uh, Atmospheric Long Range Spreading of Harmful Microorganisms. So, Emilio. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope to suck you in, in the seat because um, we are kind of tired. Um, okay, I'm coming from the Center of Advanced Studies in Blanes, and we are here in the Costa Brava, very close to Barcelona, 50 kilometers northeast. And we have the Pyrenees very close, and this is important for, the, for my talk, for the things I am going to tell you today. Okay. So this is the uh, idea we have of the productivity, productivity in the systems. Uh, so we have very productive, productive areas and some dry lands. And in the oceans, we know where there are uh, the most uh, productive areas. But here we are missing uh, part of the picture. And uh, is this, this part, the, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is the uh, component that is linking uh, all the process between all the other compartments, the hydrosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, and anthroposphere. And of course, all the processes that we have on, on land and on the water um, generate a wide range of uh, aerosols that are going into the atmosphere and then moving around. And it is important to have in mind, uh, or to, or I want to bring you to you, a health view uh, uh, or a health system view, repeat it please, um, to change our view on how important is this process. Because when you see uh, the magnitude of, of the process, you understand uh, the potential to really mix uh, everything on, her, uh, on, on Earth. Here you have uh, a time lag, this is the days, in black. Uh, in white is the smoke from fires. So we have uh, in California and uh, West States huge uh, fires that are moving in this direction. We have also here, this is uh, Iberian Peninsula to have an uh, idea of the size of these uh, processes. And in the Sahel area in Africa, a lot of dust that is moving in that uh, direction to the uh, west. Here the hurricanes. And now we are waiting for Ophelia. And when Ophelia will appear, you will realize, uh, because that the normal process is all this dust going to South America, to the Caribbean. But sometimes, depending on the position of the high and low pressure, huge amount of dust can go into uh, Europe. Uh, not fully, Ophelia is coming soon. <laughs> Ophelia. <laughs> hey, Ophelia. Yeah. So look at Ophelia. Yeah. It's really punching a huge amount of dust into uh, Europe. Yeah. Okay, video enough. So I hope with this uh, image, your uh, mind has changed a bit on, on the magnitude of these processes. And, and this is important for microbial emissions on, in the form of aerosols to the atmosphere. And it's depending on the productivity of the systems. It's related to the amount of uh, microbial emissions to the atmosphere. So the low productivity environments has low uh, microbial charge. Uh, different from the high productivity environments, either terrestrial or marine. But this is a second uh, part of information that is needed here to understand this long range uh, process of dispersal. So what we need to know here is the transport range and the environmental stress. So when uh, micros are injected in the atmosphere, they start to experience uh, environmental stress and depending 
on the uh, place that air, they are allocated in the atmosphere, they will be able to do a local uh, dispersal or really long-range dispersal. If, if they'll uh, reach, reach the free troposphere, then they will do intercontinental uh, dispersal. So what is important here is uh, to understand the difference between the local and the uh, intercontinental is the stratification that is in the atmosphere. So this is uh, land or sea. This is the troposphere, the, the first 10, 12 kilometers. We have here the ozone layer and upper uh, some other areas in the stratosphere. But we are going to focus on this uh, place. And here you have the environmental stress, means the UV, uh, humidity, uh, that are stressing cells. And here, one important concept is the atmospheric boundary layer. The atmospheric boundary layer makes the difference between local dispersal or low range dispersal. If you are above this layer, you are injected in the air streams that are connecting all the uh, earth, and you can really reach long, very long distance. If you are below the atmospheric layer, you are doing local or regional uh, colonizations. Here you are more protected, but if you are entering here, you are, more, you are suffering more stress. So you have to deal with this um, uh, difference. And to understand all these processes, we need to go back to geology and, and geography and, and all these uh, basic um, things that uh, sometime in the career they explain us all these cells uh, of the uh, air circulation, the general air circulation of Earth. And here what is important is these air rises are areas on Earth that uh, uh, warm uh, Earth are really uh, going really, really uh, several kilometers high. If you are in this area, you will be injected higher. If you are not here, you are far away from here, you are not helped by Earth to colonize these uh, upper layers. Another important point is how you manage to uh, uh, be successful in your dispersal. And here it's important, if you travel like a free cells, you will really, uh, your distance will be shorter than you go in clouds or in mineral particles. If you go in mineral particles, your strength, stress protection is higher and you can reach longer distance. So it's a good uh, strategy to be attached to mineral particles to really reach longer places. And then by dry deposition or wet deposition, you are coming back again uh, to Earth, to the Earth surface. So let's talk about a bit on mineral particles. And these mineral particles are very, very, uh, so we are living in a dusty uh, world. So we have dust everywhere. And the main source of dust is the Saharan uh, desert, but also the Gobi and some in, in Australia. Wow, well, okay. So this is the real world, the perfect world. So the herd is uh, in this, uh, allocated this, like, in this way, but you know that it uh, has an angle against the sun. So really the, the place where the sun is hitting higher is not really in the equatorial zone, it's uh, a bit higher in summer or a bit lower in winter. And these areas of air racing are known, like, uh, by, are known as uh, intertropical converse zones. And these are very important. So this concept is very important because these areas are very sensitive areas on Earth that help to spread whatever uh, you are thinking on. So anti um, microbial resistant genes, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, whatever. So if you are in these places, you are higher probability to spread uh, in larger uh, areas. And this is an example of the production of, of dust. So you see huge amount of dust and this dust is fitting 
the ETC zone. And this is the reason why all this uh, dust is uh, moving this uh, long distance to the South America. Here in Europe, we have also uh, uh, periods of uh, or, or days with uh, large amounts of dust coming from Africa. And this is, for instance, is the number of days per month in North Spain. And on average, along the different years, we have five days on average per month. But in some um, periods, we can also reach more than 20 days per month uh, of dust entering uh, Spain and South uh, Europe. If you want to track and to, to, to follow this uh, long-range distance uh, process, you have to be above the Bundali layer. And one place where uh, it's easy to reach by car and not really expensive, uh, these areas, is in the Pyrenees. So we have our uh, long-term ecological research station in the National Park of Iguas Tortos that is located nearly 2,000 meters high, so we are above the Bundali layer. And here we are collecting rain and snow for different years, trying to uh, follow all these uh, processes, all these um, bacteria and eukarya that are moving, moving around, especially this place, those that are in the long-range transport. And we need data from satellite data, so you sell a lot of data on, on the air movement, so you can do a backward trajectory of the air masses, and by that way, you are able to know the origin of the rain and the bacteria that are in that rain. And here are some, a few uh, results. Five minutes. Uh, the first unexpected is that we have seasonality. So when we start to study this uh, atmosphere, we're expecting uh, chaos. So no structure, uh, mixing, randomness, but this is not true. What we have seen is, in this case, is uh, fungi. So the richness of fungi and the relative abundance in the different years, uh, you, have, you, uh, you can see a pattern. So uh, interannual, uh, behavior, and for that reason, you can predict uh, how fungi, for instance, will behave in the coming future with the new uh, climatic scenarios. And the same for different uh, types of fungi. Some were more uh, appear more in winter, some other in summer. The same for um, well, a different type of fungi. In this case, they were more abundant always in winter. In this case, we have green algae, chlorophyta. They were also present, and more in yeah, at the end of summer and autumn for the different years, ciliophora, and so on. And the way that we represent uh, all this data is using this uh, inbound indicator that measures the specificity and fidelity of a taxa for a certain period. And is plot in that way. You have here the different taxa, and from the different seasons, some of them high are indicators of that season. And that approach has uh, forensic uh, power. So you can predict the probability that if that species appear, maybe you are more, or it's coming from uh, this period of the year. We did the same for, for bacteria, and again for the different taxa, we, we observe seasonal patterns. And just a couple of examples here. Acidobacteria were more typical from winter, and protobacteria for summer. And the same, so from the different taxa, we have the, those that are indicator for the different season. And in winter and summer, we had the higher number of indicator taxa. So winter and summer are really completely different situations. 
And with this database, we start to explore potential pathogens. And we did a first approach looking at the 16S uh, and compare those sequence with a database of known pathogens, pathogens. But of course, to check really for pathogenicity, we need to do a more specific tests a more a look for more specific genes. But as a first approach, to have an idea of the baseline, so how many or, or the, the upper limit of pathogens that are moving around. And with the same approach again, we detect some peaks at different times of the year for different pathogens. And we could uh, establish this indicator pathogens for certain, for certain periods, either for bacteria or, or fungi. And also, uh, to answer the question if dust from Sahara are um, sending more pathogens that winds coming from the Atlantic or from Europe, and apparently not, but there are some specific potential pathogens that are more related to situations where dust is present for bacteria and for uh, fungi. And most of the pathogens we found were related to, to plants, were phytopathogens, mostly fungi. We observe this interannual, interannual dynamics that allow us to predict behavior in the future. We observe close relatives to this uh, fungi that uh, has some uh, medical implications. Uh, for Saharan dust interaction, uh, were mostly phytopathogens and potential uh, human pathogens were always in low proportion. And we call in this study for more studies like this. So to spread uh, long-term stations around the, the, on Earth to really get the real picture of how common is this process and make connections uh, to really understand all the uh, movement of this uh, bacteria around. We are also dealing to, to trying to understand um, the functional traits for those uh, species, those, those taxa that were more recurrent and more often found in, in, the, in the long term data set. And we are extracting some functional traits that allow us to understand the strategy that certain bacteria have to deal with all this stress in the atmosphere. Um, either they have uh, mechanisms to repair pigments, uh, exopolysaccharides, metabolic uh, uh, strategies to obtain energy to keep alive. Uh, and some different species have different uh, strategies, uh, combinations. And uh, a second study was more focused on uh, antibiotic resistant genes. And again, we were uh, uh, asking ourselves if uh, we can determine if uh, antibiotic resistant genes can be long range and intercontinental uh, dispersed using the same mechanism of aerosols in this upper troposphere. Uh, and using our pristine uh, system, uh, so if you are in the center of the Pyrenees in a national park, you don't expect very close that antibiotic resistant genes are, are present. So if you detect them, potentially are coming from really far away. And trying to understand these potential sources of diffus diffusive uh, spread of these antibiotic resistant genes. And this is QPCR data using a specific primers for different type of antibiotic resistant genes. And yes, we detect uh, several of them. We also detect some uh, dynamics, seasonal dynamics. And we observe that uh, resistant to sulfonamides, uh, tetracyclines, and this uh, uh, integrase uh, gene that uh, is related to anthropogenic pollutions were long range and persistently dispersed in free troposphere aerosols. A major deposition of tetracycline resistance 
will relate with higher intensification of uh, African dust outbreaks. We also trace back the origin of this uh, bacteria carrying, potentially carrying these this genes, and most of them were related to uh, agricultural soils. Uh, therefore, our study potentially unveils that air messes pathways are vectors that shape uh, antibiotic resistant genes, intercontinental dispersal, and global spread of uh, this kind of genes. And because climate regulates uh, aerosolization and long range air mass movements, we call for a more careful evaluation of the connections between land use, climate change, and long range intercontinental intercontinental dispersal. And this is a um, review in a recent paper where all the different sources and chains in the different sources can affect the impact of the microbial disperse and, and micro, uh, microecology. The fluxes also can, can be uh, changed and uh, lately affect, have human uh, effects relate to change in all these uh, compartments. Well, in more, you can go to the review if you want more details. And just a take home message. So it is very important where we allocate all these uh, sources of uh, aerosol emissions, how we deal with uh, our forests, because we have to introduce this uh, uh, health uh, systems view. So depending on, on the areas, there are sensitive areas where we can exacerbate uh, the processes and should be included in the policy. So some areas should be more carefully treated, like Sahel area. So if we protect this area with uh, trying to avoid uh, lakes desiccation, changing land use, erosion, we will protect the global health. And the same for all these uh, manures and all this stuff that is producing, as Manu said, a lot of antibiotics. And depending on the area of the earth, can be really inject to the high atmosphere and uh, contaminate the world system. Uh, I think it's all. Yes, we'll be happy to take any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emilio. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Ricardo. Very nice presentation. Uh, but my question is, uh, probably I'm wrong. I, I understood that the source of iron for the Atlantic Ocean comes from the Sahara, from the dust that you show. If we prevent that, we might have another problem. Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> but now the, the system is uh, um, out of control, I would say. So we are exacerbating this process uh, higher than the system can really be uh, uh, under control, I would say, under uh, stable situation. So, for instance, in the Caribbean, the number of um, infections by, in the corals by fungi apparently is related to the large amount of dust, larger than the system can deal with. And also the change in the chat, in like lake chat, uh, because the use of water and change in land use, all the uh, contaminants, DDT, pathogens that were in the sediment of the lake, and uh, now that the lake is dried, and all this sediment is injected to the high atmosphere because it's in this sensitive area. And this is something we can deal with. So Lake Chat should be still a lake, and water should be look for water somewhere else, somewhere else, because this is a like the Amazonas. It's some areas that are really sensitive for the global health. So we should change mind. So countries cannot deal with those areas that belong to the global system, and maybe other structures that policy will create to, to deal with this. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think the ses this session is 
now finished, but I think there are some closing words from Edith and Angela now. Is that right? So we can maybe. So I think we'll do a duet. <laughs> so I just want to say, I mean, it was amazing to hear all these uh, presentations and to go from, you know, the inner workings of the gut to space and, and wind and oceans. And so um, amazing. I think uh, this was a very carefully well-chosen uh, workshop. So I want to thank all of those people who helped put the program together and all of the speakers because um, it was truly impressive. And I do hope that um, this is just the beginning. I think there are already several interactions and I think there are some very uh, key sort of intersections between the sorts of things that Emble is doing or will be doing, um, as you heard from our colleagues, and what many of you are doing uh, here in um, Spain. And so I really look forward to the next steps. And we were just discussing um, with Angela what the next step should be. And I think from our perspective, um, our international relations office and our strategy office will be able to put people into contact if they haven't yet been able to find their partners. Um, and I do hope, uh, from what I've heard from my colleagues, that there will be some uh, ideas about uh, collaborations, but also perhaps running a different or specific type of workshop. And I think now this is really a, a networking event, the beginning of uh, mutual awareness and, and building things up together. So from my perspective, um, it was a, a huge achievement. I was really happy to be here today um, to meet some of you, not all of you, unfortunately, and hopefully there will be other occasions. So thank you all. It was really a pleasure. Um, thanks very much, Edith. Um, it's been a day of um, celebration of science, actually, and this is really fantastic. We have been listening to all these wonderful, um, you know, st studies that uh, are being done both uh, at Emble and, and in Spain. And, and indeed, we are looking forward to the uh, collaborations that will come out from this. And uh, maybe the most important point is uh, sort of uh, the spirit of a joint mission between uh, SESIC and uh, EMBL, so that we can actually work together for our future, really, for the future of Europe and also of the planet, uh, with the fantastic program that you have. So um, I just, uh, we actually have to leave. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we would like to stay here and discuss with you, I mean, for hours now. But uh, the only thing that I really uh, have to tell you is that uh, on behalf of, of uh, the, the president, Rosa Menendez, uh, we want to thank you all for being here and for such a wonderful day. So for those of you who have to travel, have safe travels, and thank you very much. Looking forward to the next uh, workshop. Thank you. Most of the online people. Thanks also to all those online. I hope it was enjoyable, and uh, please do reach out to... Hannah and uh, the people from CSIC who were in touch if you do need to get emails um, and you don't have them. So thank you so much. Thank you.